Chapter One of Gargoyles. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Roger Moline. Gargoyles by Ben Hecht. Chapter One. The calendar said nineteen hundred. It was growing warm. George Cornelius Bazine emerged from Madame Minnie's house of ill fame at five o'clock on a Sabbath May morning. He was twenty-five years old, neatly dressed, a bit unshaven, and whistling valiantly, "'Won't you come home, Bill Bailey? Won't you come home?' Considering the high estate which was to be his, as the estimable Senator Bazine, the introduction savors of malice." But, it must be remembered, this was twenty-two years ago, and moreover in a day before the forces of decency had triumphed. The soul of man was still unregenerate. Prostitutes, saloons, hell-holes still flourished unchallenged in the city's heart, and Bazine, even at twenty-five, was not one of those aggravating anomalies who pride themselves upon being ahead of their time or behind their time. Bazine was of his time. And on this day which witnessed him whistling on the doorstep of Madame Minnie's, the devil was still a gentleman, albeit a gentleman in bad standing. But being a gentleman, he was tolerated. Tradition, in a manner, still clothed him in the guise of a Rabelaisian clown, high-born but fallen. He walked abroad in his true character, flaunting his red tights, his cloven hoof, his spiked tail, and his mysterious horns. A mid-Victorian devil innocent of further disguise, his face still undisfigured by the Kaiser's mustachio or the Bolshevist's whiskers. A naive, unctuous lout of a devil with straightforward tempter's proclivities an antagonist not for Dr. Wilson's and M. Clemenceau's and the societies for the spread of true Americanization, but an unpolitical, highly orthodox, leering, pitchfork-brandishing vis-a-vis -vis for simple men of God. In short, the devil was still a devil and not a complex. It was growing warm, and the calendars said, a new century. A new century and the great men of the day pointed with stern, pregnant fingers at the calendars and proclaimed, A new century! A new century! Beautiful phrase! The soul of man, in its struggle toward God knows what, paused elatedly to contemplate the new milestone. Elated as all youth is elated for no other reason than that there is a tomorrow, a tomorrow of unknown and multiple milestones elated with the knowledge of progress, that sage and flattering word by which the soul of man explains the baffling phenomenon of its survival. The great men of the day stood staring through half-closed eyes at the calendars, to anticipate by a single day. But the future no less than the past remains a current mystery, and the great men, the prophets, confined themselves with stentorian caution to the prophecy. A new century has dawned. Bazine, whistling and waiting for his companion to emerge on Madame Minnie's doorstep, regarded the scene about him with the hardened moral indifference of youth. It was growing warm. The May sun was striding, an incongruous provincial virgin, through a litter of blousy streets. Under its mocking light, the rows of bawdy houses and saloons suffered an architectural collapse. Walls, windows, roofs, and chimneys leered tiredly at each other. The district seemed indeed an illustration for a parable of vice and virtue drawn by the venomously partial pen of some unusually half-witted cleric, dirty-faced brothels tousled cafe signs, bleary sidewalks, 
toothless storefronts, all cowering before the rebuke of God's Son. A few mysterious solitaries lent a vague life to the scene. The figure of a drunk, unchastened, zigzagging humorously down the pavement, like some nocturnal clown prowling after a vanished bacchanal. A hastily dressed prostitute carrying her night's earnings as an offering to early devotion. A few unseasoned revelers overcome with a nostalgia for clean bathrooms and Sunday morning waffles at the family board, sleepily fleeing the scenes of their carouse. All this formed no part of the preoccupations of the whistling one. He was waiting for his companion, and for the fifteenth time the tune of Bill Bailey came softly from his lips. The companion appeared, a crestfallen young man of twenty-three, Hugh Keegan by name. An idiotic wistfulness marked the blond vacuity of his face. They said nothing and walked to the streetcar track. Here they must wait. There was no car in sight. Basine employed the wait, jumping out from the curbing and peering with a great show of interest down the deserted tracks. The night's dissipation had left him perversely elate. His vanity demanded that he confound the scenes of his recent moral collapse by exhibitions of undiminished vigor of body and gaiety of mind. So he capered back and forth between the curb and the deserted tracks, ostentatiously unbuttoning his coat to the chill of the dawn and addressing brisk, cheerful sallies to his penitent friend. It was this way with Basine. He had spent the night in sin. Now he must act as if he had not spent the night in sin. It was a matter of deceiving his conscience, and Basine's conscience did not live in Basine. It was, to the contrary, a mysterious external force, something quite outside him. He eyed the virtuous hallelujahs of the sunrise with a somewhat overemphasized aplomb. Dimly he felt that a god was articulating in dawns and sunbeams. As long as he had continued his whistling, these facts had remained concealed. But now he had grown tired of Bill Bailey, and at once God, peering out of his beautiful rosy heaven, was saying, "'Shame on you!' Everything seemed to be waiting to repeat this banal reproof. This was the conscience of George Basine, a reproof that came from without. He felt an inclination to defiance before this reproof. He was young and given to evil. He was only natural, considering the time in which he lived and the biological impulses of youth. But to do evil was one thing. To defend it after it was done was another. Thus Basine, having sinned lustily through the night, avoided the more unspeakable sin of defending his action. The reproof arrived. He faced it with candor and intelligence, prepared to admit that he had done wrong. He did not want God mumbling around inside him, as was the case with his friend Keegan. God mumbled around inside of Keegan and made him feel like the devil. But Basine, there was no occasion for God to argue his point. He, Basine, surrendered gracefully and forthwith. That was the way to handle situations of the soul. To Basine, situations of the soul were a species of external discomforts he identified as God. They were the regulations and taboos of a civilization to which he was prepared at all times to submit, providing such submission did not compromise him. One got rid of taboos by looking them squarely in the eye and simulating respect or remorse. Taboos were good manners. One had to be polite to good manners. Basine laughed, not defiantly. He had already made his apologies to the dawn. The dawn was God's good manners. 
it entered the world as precisely and as perfectly as the saintly wife of a great financier might enter her grandmother's drawing-room waiting beside the car track basine was already a reformed and forgiven man the sun was like a huge salvation army marching through the highways of evil beating great drums and singing are you washed are you washed in the blood of the lamb he was glad of it he was glad to be once more a part of a virtuous world a citizen of an ideal republic given to the great causes of progress this adjustment completed memories of the night came to him as they waited for the car these memories failed naturally to conflict with his character as a citizen of virtue for they were memories which he was prepared at any moment to repudiate and denounce thus prepared he could of course enjoy them the memories brought an elation the elation which usually fills the healthy male of twenty-five upon discovering or rediscovering that the devil is as alluring as he is painted and that the wages of sin are neither death nor disillusion. He had enjoyed himself. Sin was wrong. But if one knew it was wrong, one could go ahead and enjoy it. The great thing was to know it was wrong, to admit it frankly and share in the general indignation of it, and not to go around like a vicious-minded freak defending it, like some people he knew were in the habit of doing thus on this may morning basine was able to grasp the enormity of his offense and to apologize wholeheartedly for its commission and simultaneously to enjoy the memory of it he had come away from madame minnie's with an egoistic impression of his prowess and with the self-satisfaction which comes of the knowledge of having cheated the devil out of his due by his careful method he remembered with a warmth in his throat, as if he were recalling something beautiful, how the creature had looked at the first moment she stood before him. He had spent the earlier part of the night getting creditably drunk. Lured into the brothel by a woman with a hard childish face, he had devoted himself for several hours to the despicable business of sin. The sordid make-believe of passion had pleased him vastly. He had managed, in fact, to achieve an observation on life. As the night waned, he had grown philosophical and thought how with good women one began with personal talk, with an exchange of confidences. One began with emotions, with gentle lacerations, wistfulness, sadness and one progressed from these toward the intimacy of physical contact. But with bad women, one began with the intimacy of physical contact. Only the abrupt matter-of-fact tone of the thing robbed the contact of all intimacy. And one progressed from this contact toward a wistfulness, a gentle shyness, and finally an exchange of confidences and personal talk. This last contained in it the thrill of intimacy. A good woman surrendered her body and inspired thereby a sense of possession. A bad woman surrendered the secret of her birthplace and of her real name and inspired a similar sense. There was also obvious the fact that the same sense of dramatic coquetry, idealism, modesty or whatever it was that induced the good woman to withhold her body induced the bad woman to withhold her confidence under the influence of this knowledge basine had pursued the usual tactics of the predatory male and as a fillip to the unimaginative excitements of the night obtained from his accomplice in sin the story of her life the mystery of a bad woman is that she was once virtuous, he thought as he fell asleep, just as the mystery of a virtuous woman is that she could be bad. An hour later he awoke, and with a thrill of quixotic honesty 
placed five dollars in the moist hand of the sleepin' hoary, gathering his friend Keegan out of an adjoining room, and emerged once more into the world with a clear head, a body full of elated memories, and a laudable conviction that he had done wrong but that what happened yesterday was not a part of today, and that a man can grant himself absolution from sin as easily as he can lay aside virtue. As for Keegan, he stared with mild eyes at the dawn, at the beggarly alleys and the negro porter dreamily sweeping cigar stubs out of the lopsided doorway. He listened patiently to his friend's enthusiasms. To Keegan there was something inexplicable about Basine's morning-after pose. Keegan had not yet found a place for God. Platitudes were not a background against which he might posture to his convenience. Instead, they were terrible intimates. They operated his thought for him. After committing a sin, one should be repentant. The commission of sin was, of course, an outrage but somehow the platitudes did not quite reach into the bedroom of evil. They remained hovering outside the door, marking time, as it were, and whispering through the keyhole, Just wait, just wait. And as soon as he had emerged from the room, in fact even before that, they had taken possession of him again. They demanded now repentance, thorough repentance, which included thorough repudiation of all joyous memories, all pleasurable moments. And Keegan, surrendering himself as a matter of necessity to their demands, presented the exterior of a sorrowing victim to the dawn. He offered a nod or a surprised stare as punctuation for his friend's discourse, chewing the while on an unsuccessfully lighted cigar which tasted sour. There was something different about her from the usual girl of that kind, Basine was explaining. Wouldn't talk for a while, but finally got confidential and began to cry a bit. This was a lie, reflecting credit, however, on the youth's dramatic sense and vanity. The knowledge that the creature under discussion had been actually no different from the six other ladies of her profession with whom he had experienced moral collapses since leaving the university in no way interfered with his opinion of the recent episode. It was his opinion that things he touched were somehow different from things other young men dallied with, that events which befell him were of a certain mysterious fiber lacking in the events which befell others. Thus he was reduced to the necessity of continual lying in order to vindicate this conviction, more powerful than reality. Lying to himself as much as to anyone else. By his lies Basine accomplished the dual purpose of adjusting inferior incidents to the superiority of his nature and of impressing this superiority upon his friends. A way of rewriting life so as to fit himself with the heroic part, as yet denied him in the manuscript, and which he sincerely felt was his due. Yes, she cried a bit. They usually do, you know. Keegan was innocent of this phenomenon, but nodded. He felt mysteriously saddened by the fact that they never wept for him. Life denied him many things. The creature he had spent the night with had treated him somewhat brutally. She had laughed several times. He sought, however, to make up for the indifference with which he felt himself treated by heightening his contempt for her as a sinner. This necessitated an increase of his contempt for himself as having been a partner in evil. But that was a spiritual gesture made bearable by the wave of remorse it aroused and by the knowledge that remorse was a laudable emotion. Nevertheless, despite the remorse and the rehabilitation it offered his vanity, he continued to feel life denied him many things. 
Basine continued, "'You could take a girl like that and make something of her. Give her a month.' By which he meant, give George Cornelius Basine a month and see the miracle he would work. Keegan sighed. He admired George, and his admiration of others always depressed him. He was intelligent enough to know that he admired things he lacked. And yet, he assured himself, he would despise the things in himself that he admired in others. Therefore, it was very probable that he despised them in others, or would at some later day, unless he managed to conceal the fact, or lose track of it in the confusion of platitudes which served him for a brain. He looked enviously at his friend, before whom hardened trollops dissolved in tears. "'She's only been in the game a little while, you know, Hugh. A convent girl, too. She told me her story. How she got started, you know. A love affair with a Spaniard, a highly connected fellow.' Basine prattled on improvising a melodrama of virtue led astray, editing the vaguely worded generalities of the creature he had left asleep. Eventually he tired of the game and announced abruptly, "'Not a car in sight. What do you say we walk, Hugh?' The idea of walking four miles home after a wild night engaged his vanity things by which he proved the dubious superiority of his body pleased him. "'I think I'll run along,' said Keegan. "'Nothing doing, Huey. You come with me. We'll have breakfast at my house.' Keegan frowned. There were two sisters and a mother in Basine's home. "'I can't.' "'Why not?' Oh, because. Basine persisted, gently malicious. It amused him to inconvenience his friend's scruples. It also gave him a feeling of moral supremacy. Keegan was ashamed to go to his home with him. He pitied him for this, and yet enjoyed the fact. It was because Keegan didn't feel sure of himself, of his being a man of virtue, and he, Basine, did. There was no question about it in his mind. Ashamed? he asked with a smile. No, Keegan grunted. Well, you haven't done anything worse than me, by which he meant, we do things differently, and I am above things that knock you out. Keegan stared at his friend furtively. There were things inexplicable in George Basine. He must admire them. There was nothing inexplicable in himself. He hesitated about going, however. A combination of platitudes was involved. He felt the necessity of repentance. And then he felt the necessity of hiding his shame. And finally platitude cautioned him indignantly against affronting three good women a mother and two daughters, with the presence of one lately come from the flesh-pots of Satan. This was a superior platitude, because it came also under the index of good manners. But Basine, taking him by the elbow, swept him along, platitudes and all. An inexplicable Basine, whom he admired, envied, despised, and who was his best friend and his model. They walked together, Basine briskly to hide the sudden heaviness of his legs, Keegan yielding to the less pronounced physical drain he had undergone, and falling into a weary protesting gait. End of chapter 1 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 2 of Gargoyles this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Gargoyles by Ben Hecht. Chapter 2. 
the death of Howard Basine had precipitated a creditable outburst of grief on the part of his widow and two daughters. The event had brought his son George home from college. They had shared a bed for twenty-six years, Basine Pear and Basine Mare, achieving an utter disregard of each other, which both took pride in identifying as domestic happiness. In their youth love had brought them together while comparative strangers, and after twenty-six years death had parted them still strangers. But now complete and total strangers, Siamese twins who had never been introduced to each other. Each had grown old by the side of the other, subscribing to the same thoughts, worries, ambitions. It was as if a thin shell had grown around each of them. This shell was their home, their mutual interest in bank balances, diversions, and tomorrows. It was the product of their practical energies, their standing in the eyes of their friends, their success and their solidity as a social unit. It was their pride in new rugs, in invitations to functions, in their children. There were two shells. One was Basine Pear. One was Basine Mare. For twenty-six years these two shells cohabited together. But inside each of them there had been a world of things that had never connected and that remained forever part of a mutually preserved secret little daydreams, absurdities, the swaggering, pensive, impractical rigmarole of thought life to which the world of reality, the shell world, had remained almost to the last no more than a vaguely sensed exterior. Each of them had lived almost continually apart from this shell. They had given but a fraction of their energies toward its creation. It had required only a little part of themselves to become two placidly successful, conventionally happy people with the home and family. The rest of themselves they had allowed to evaporate. A pleasing process, evaporation. Dreams, ambitions, longings, all these had evaporated slowly and secretively during the twenty-six years, vanished into thin air and each had been preoccupied with this process of evaporation. It had been their real life, the life which diverted them and which they mutually concealed from each other as they sat together reading of evenings, or rode in cars, or waited in offices, or lay in bed. Here in this real life were success and beauty and marvelous activities. Here Basine Pear planned Herculean enterprise and triumphed with magnificent gestures, became a leader of finance, of armies, became a lover of queens and odalisks, Caressing from day to day phantasms which had no existence, it was in them that he chiefly existed. He confined himself not only to illusions of grandeur. There were also little things, charming minor victories, which delighted his ego almost as much as the greater ones. He was able to trick out the minor victories with the illusion of reality. They were things that might happen, that one could dream about almost as actually happening. Things that he fancied people might be saying about him. Admissions that he fancied people might make to him. Dreams that he fancied he inspired in women who passed him and whom he never saw again. This illusory existence preoccupying Basine had fitted him ideally for the companionship of orderly, placid minded folk preoccupied, like himself, with similar processes of evaporation. These folks were his friends with whom he went to the theater, played cards, transacted business, discussed issues. They were known as normal, practical persons. The vast, illusory worlds in which they lived during the greater part of their hours in no way encroached upon the realities of their day. They were proud of having a grip on themselves, by which they meant of being able to allow their energies to evaporate secretively, instead of feeling inspired to harness them to realities 
and run the risk of being hoisted body and soul out of their shells into a maelstrom of uncertainties and hullabaloos. In order to rationalize the disparity between their actual estates and the fantastic estates of their illusory lives, they devoted a part of their energies to the practical business of glorifying their shells. They subscribed with indignation, sometimes with fanaticism, to all social, spiritual, and political ideas which had for their objective the glorification of their shells. They became champions of systems of thought and conduct which excused on one hand and deified on the other their devitalized modes of existence. In fact, as they grew older, they developed a curious egoism which took the form of a pride in their suppressions. They thought of themselves as men who had achieved a superior sanity. This sanity lay in being able to recognize the real from the unreal. The real was their shell. The unreal consisted of the fanities produced by the process of evaporation. This sanity, too, enabled them to regard their imaginings and dreamings with an amused condescension and to mature into unruffled effigies, practical, hard-headed businessmen. The evaporation, however, influenced them in one vital respect. It effected what they called their taste in the arts. They desired things they read or listened to in the theater to be authentic interpretations, not of the realities about them, but of the illusions in which they secretly exhausted themselves. They desired the heroes and heroines of literature and drama to be like the creatures and excitements of the soap-bubble worlds bursting conveniently about their hard heads. And so, in their reading and theater going, they enjoyed only those things which afforded a few hours of vicarious reality to the grotesqueries, to the fairy tale expansions of their departing dreams. During the last years of his life, Basine had experienced the fullest rewards of a virtuous, practical life. At fifty, he had become empty. The rigmarole of daydreams grew vaguer and finally ceased. He had become bored with his grandiose and illusory selves. Don Juan, Napoleon, Croesus no longer wore the features of Basine. There was no longer any thrill in idly decorating his tomorrows with kaleidoscopic make-believes. There was no great tragedy in this. He was bored with his imagination because he had run through the repertoire of his fancies too often, and so, slowly, his days grew more and more void of unrealities. Slowly, also, he turned to the tangible things around him. He contemplated proudly the details of his shell. It was a comforting shell. It fitted him snugly. It consisted of his friends, his home, his children, his borrowed ideas, his wife. No outward change was to be noticed in Basine Pear when this happened. There was nothing to say that the process of evaporation had ended and that there was left an animate husk called Howard Basine a husk that did not mourn at the knowledge of its emptiness, but that accepted instead, with piety and gratitude, the presence of other husks, pleased and warm to move among their empty companionships. It was at this time that Basine proudly felt himself a worthwhile member of society, and grew to smile with tolerant disdain upon all persons who busied themselves with the illusions he had overcome by the simple process of denying them life. He called them fools, scoundrels, lunatics, and dreamers, and he agreed with his friends that they were creatures engaged in filling the world with discomfort and error. His dislike for them did not make him unhappy, for he was content in the flattering knowledge that most people, everybody he knew and whose opinion he valued, were like himself. His thoughts were nearly everybody's thoughts, and his life was like everybody's life. There was a sense of strength, 
even satisfaction in this. He relapsed gracefully into a quiet emptiness, out of which he was able to derive final embalming fluid for his vanity by pitying the distractions and unrest of others. Then he died. The sight of her husband lying under the glass of the coffin had reminded Mrs. Basine of the curious fact that in their youth love had brought them together. A memory burrowed its way from under the debris of twenty-six years and comforted her. A memory of wild nights, flushed cheeks, shining eyes, hope and careless words. And the dim yesterday, the long-forgotten yesterday that lay in the coffin with the paunchy figure of the bald-headed silk merchant became suddenly real again. When she was alone that night, Mrs. Basine wept miserably for a love that had died twenty-five years ago and lain buried and unmourned under the debris of these years. A tardy exposition of grief, sincere but enfeebled in its own age, it spent itself in a few hours. The tears for the memory of vanished youth and vanished love, of which the body waiting in the coffin had become for a space of grotesque symbol, were followed by the inarticulate sense of an anticlimax. Howard Basine's dying was somehow not a tragedy to the woman who had lived with him for twenty-six years. When she had wept at first, the idea of death came like a panic to her heart. Things had died. Days, nights, hopes had died. But she had been unaware of them dying. The figure of her husband leaving for his day's work, returning from his day's work, sitting at the head of the table, retiring to bed with her, this had been a mask behind which the dying of things remained concealed. Now that he had closed his eyes and vanished, it was as if a mask had been removed. One could see all at once all the things that had died. And she saw not only Howard lying dead, but most of herself. In her mind she had no memory of the illusory selves she had lived, like her husband, alone. These illusory selves whose successes and romances she had caressed in secret had of late abandoned her. Like her husband, she had turned to the shells they had created about themselves as the comforting reward of her life's negation. Now it struck her that these shells were full of dead things. While he lived, they had seemed alive. The fact that the man with whom she had survived twenty-six years continued to talk and to move had given her the vague feeling that these years were also still alive, still existent somewhere. Now the man was dead, and the years were dead with him. They had been dead all the while, but they had not lain in a coffin for one to look at like this. Dead years. And she, a survivor. Her sense of contact with the past deserted her. She was alone. Everything that had been was no more, and it seemed during her grief as if it had never existed. She lay and wept, feeling that something had been terribly wasted. Once there had been youth. Now there was age. She had already lived, but how? Where? Look, she was already old, but how had it happened? She who could remember so many things about youth, her pretty face, her careless hopes, bright, happy excitements, and most of all, the feeling that things lay ahead, that a store of mysterious things waited for her, she who could remember it so plainly was an old woman. It had seemed natural before he died, but now it seemed unnatural. She would die soon, too. Her youth, something she thought of as youth, arose and stretched out far away arms to her. It came to her in the night and stood smiling at her like a ghost of herself. Yes, she was already dead, 
and she could lie in bed weeping for her husband and staring with tired eyes at memories. Thoughts did not disturb her. Her emotions, grown too involved for the shallows of her mind, gave her the consciousness merely of a panic. But the panic left. It receded slowly, and the death of her husband stirred in her during the first weeks of mourning a gentle affection for the man. She closeted herself with the memories that had terrified her, sensual memories of an impetuous lover, an idealization of a long-forgotten Howard. And her sorrow became like a vague honeymoon shared with slowly dissolving erotic shadows. This, too, went. As it went away, the widow became curiously younger in her features, her black clothes, her mannerisms. She grew to find the loneliness of her bed desirable. She would snuggle kittenishly between the empty sheets, an unintelligible sense of immorality, as if it were immoral to sleep alone, lending a luxury to her weariness. Yes, it was somehow nicer to sleep alone, to have the bedroom all to herself. In her mind, things that were different from the routine of her life, and that belonged to the secret imaginings that had once filled her days, were immoral. And this was different, being alone. So her living on without her husband became an odd sort of infidelity, pleasant, diverting. The year and a half passed bringing a rejuvenation to her body. Her youth and its decline were buried in a coffin. Now, at fifty-two, she was living again and creating out of the remains of her figure, coiffure and complexion, a new youth, at least a new exterior. The dreams of her earlier days returned to her, and she no longer found it necessary to deny them all reality. It had been necessary before in order to keep herself fitted into the shell. And as a result, her dreams, denied any possibility of realization, had become like his, more and more fantastic, more and more warmly improbable. Now there was no need for a shell. There was no need to preserve an easily recognizable and never-failing characterization. She had done that before so as to avoid confusing her husband and herself, and she had been rewarded by a similar ruse employed by him. Now that he was gone, she found herself changing. She found herself approaching the romantic conception of herself. And since she was able to carry into reality her rejuvenated fancies, to devote herself to looking stunning, to making a somewhat exotic impression upon people, to arousing interest, her imaginings did not expand as before into distorted and improbable pictures. She began to busy herself, to actively give them outlet, to have time or surplus energies for the evolution of fancies beyond her. She had no plans for the future, and she was not interested in any. An amazing fact had come into her life, the present. She abandoned herself to it. She had harnessed what was left of the energies, allowed so long to evaporate, and the process of evaporation was at an end. She would become, if there was time, a keenly alive, egoistic woman, gorging herself upon the desserts remaining at the banquet board, before which she had sat for twenty-six years with closed eyes and listless hands. She felt these things only dimly. There was a freedom to life, like a new taste in her senses. Of this she was confusedly aware. And her sorrow for her dead husband became a pleasant thing, a thing inseparable from the gratitude she unknowingly felt for the new existence his death had given her. She referred to him with a pensively magnanimous air, inventing perfections in his character and endowing his departed intelligence with a wisdom far beyond her own. 
This enabled her to utilize his memory in an odd way. When she argued with her friends or children, when she was doubtful concerning the extravagance or selfishness of her actions, or the newly born radicalism of her views, she would quote mercilessly from her dead husband. The fact that he was dead lent a sanctity to whatever views he may have held. Not in her own eyes, but, as she shrewdly sensed, in the eyes of others. And she grew to play unscrupulously upon this thing she perceived in her children and friends, that they respected the words and opinions of a dead man infinitely more than those of one alive. Thus she was able to indulge herself in ways which would have astounded and perhaps horrified the departed Basine, and to bring her immediate circle to accept these ways as conventionally desirable by making her dead husband their spiritual sponsor. Her friends chafed under this ruse, but felt themselves powerless to combat it. They were men and women who lived on the opinions of the dead, who subscribed fanatically to all ideas sanctified by the length of their interment. Themselves, they practiced the ruse of editing the wisdoms of the past, as well as prophecies of the future, into vindications of the present. They felt indignant but powerless before the treachery of Mrs. Bazine, who raided the mausoleum for private articles of faith. Mrs. Bazine was aware at first of lying, but this feeling gave way to a conviction that if her husband had not thought and said the things she attributed to him while he was alive, he would have done so had he continued to live. "'Because,' she said to herself, "'we were always alike and thought and said the same things, always.'" Her son George was proud of his mother, but inclined to be dubious about the change that had come over her. He was irritated particularly one evening to hear his mother advocate equal suffrage rights for women to a group of surprised friends gathered at their home. "'I think such ideas foolish and dangerous,' George explained politely. "'Why?' his mother inquired. Basine shook his head. He had given the subject no thought. But a militant defense of the status quo inspired him always with a comfortable feeling of rectitude. "'I see no reason,' pursued Mrs. Bazine, "'why women shouldn't vote as well as men. I remember your father was very much interested in the issue of women's suffrage. He said the day would come when women voted shoulder to shoulder with men and that the country would be improved by it. Basine stared at his mother. He had grown to realize that she had discovered the trick of lending weight and irrefutable wisdoms to her own notions by surrounding them with the sanctity of death, for it was almost impossible to fly in the face of a quotation from his father. The fact that the man was dead seemed to make contradiction of any ideas or prophecies attributed to him a sacrilege. There was also the fact becoming daily more obvious that his mother was turning into an unscrupulous administrator of the dead man's opinions. "'I never heard father say anything of the kind,' he exclaimed suddenly. And then, feeling that a loss of temper was the only way in which he could cover the affront he had offended his mother, he added with indignation, you keep backing up your arguments by dragging Dad's corpse into them all the time. Mrs. Bazine looked at him in amazement, and he reddened. He apologized quickly. Mrs. Bazine, shocked by her son's unexpected penetration, bit her lip and became silent. She let the argument pass, not without observing that her friends present appeared for a moment to rally around her son's exposé, as if he had given words to their own attitude. She decided, when she was alone again, to be more careful. She loved her son, and felt a dread of sacrificing his respect. 
there was a dread also of sacrificing the respect of these others who had looked at her for a moment with an accusing understanding there had been present a mrs gilchrist an old creature of oracular senilities whom she had grown secretly to detest but the detestation she felt was accompanied by a vivid desire to keep in with the woman mrs gilchrist was a person of position decided position her son aubrey was a novelist this alone endowed the gilchrist tribe with an aura of culture they lived in evanston and were active mother and son in the social life of the town mrs basine was unable as yet to determine the reasons that made her dislike her in her secret mind she called Mrs. Gilchrist a domineering old fool. But she stopped with that. There was the Gilchrist social position. Society had always interested Mrs. Basine, but since her widowhood this interest had become active. She had read the society columns of the newspapers regularly, and through the twenty-six years of her married life, retained the singular idea that the people whose names appeared in these columns belonged to a closely knit organization similar to the masons only of course infinitely superior the appearance of a new name among the list of socially known always stirred an indignation in her she was not a bounder herself the closely knit organization whose members poured tea gave bazaars occupied boxes at the theater had been in her mind a fixed and invulnerable institution neither to be taken by storm nor won by strategy thus she had excused her lack of social ambition and success by investing society with an almost magical aloofness a sort of superhuman coterie of tea pourers and benefit givers that kept itself intact and beyond intrusion by the exercise of incredible diligence among her daydreams during these years had been those of magnificent social successes of long newspaper articles describing with awe her splendor and prestige but in reality she would as soon have thought of breaking into society as of attacking twelve policemen with a carving knife she resented therefore the appearance of new names in the society columns bounders she would murmur to herself half expecting that the organization into which they had bounded would issue some outraged and withering excommunication upon the new tea pourer but the name would appear again and again and after such innumerable appearances Mrs. Basine would automatically accept its presence within the organization and rally quixotically to its defense against the other bounders struggling to invade the sanctity it had achieved. And although during this period of her life Mrs. Basine had felt none of the low instincts which inspired the bounders to bound, she had endeavored to the best of her abilities to mimic as much as a humble outsider could the spiritual elegancies which distinguished the organization. She succeeded in creating a formal atmosphere about her home, a dignity about her table of which she was modestly proud. She had felt in secret that any member of the organization entering her house, an event of which she dreamed as a waveringly sophisticated child might dream of a fairy's visit, would have experienced no dismay. Now this attitude which had characterized her married life was changing. Society was no longer an impregnable organization. Mrs. Basine was, in fact, engaged determinedly upon its conquest, and her attitude toward the detestable Mrs. Gilchrist was colored by that fact. An acquaintanceship with the Gilchrists had been achieved through maneuverings of her daughters as workers in charity bazaars managed by the woman. Until the death of her husband, Mrs. Basine had ignored her two daughters. 
a proprietary feeling in them which exhausted itself in dictating the surface details of their lives had been the extent of her interest she had presumed during their childhood and adolescence that they were basines and nothing else this had guided her parenthood being basines they must conform to basinism which meant that they must be like their mother or their father and she struggled carelessly to see that their youth did not assert itself in ways inimical to her own characterization doris the younger was inclined to be beautiful fanny however had always seemed to her a more substantial person but her widowhood had brought a belated curiosity concerning these young women she wondered at times what their dreams were she understood that they were strangers and this began to interest her she was proud of them and although undemonstrative would sometimes put her arms around both of them as they walked to a neighbor's after dinner they did not inspire the pride in her however that her son did george had finished his law and she felt as she listened to him talk or watched his face at the table that he was somebody there was an assurance and health about him his keen-featured face the straight black hair parted in the center the movements of his lithe body always quick and definite and particularly his hands these made her think of him vaguely as an artist somebody different she knew in her heart that although he seemed to differ in his ideas from none of their friends he was not like other young men end of chapter two recording by roger moline Chapter Three of Gargoyles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Gargoyles by Ben Hecht. Chapter Three. It was Sunday morning. Mrs. Basine and her two daughters were sitting down to breakfast. Hugh Keegan followed Basine embarrassedly into the dining room. The two young men had been renovating themselves for an hour in the bathroom. The meal started casually. Fanny Basine studied their guest with what was meant to be a provoking carelessness. She was a facile virgin who wooed men persistently and slapped their faces for misunderstanding her. "'You've been quite a stranger, Mr. Keegan,' she said. Her eyes smiled. Keegan felt wretched. He was conscious of being unclean. The fresh, virginal face of the girl smiling at him filled him with rage. He accepted a waffle from Mrs. Basine with exaggerated formality. He was not enraged with himself. This was too difficult. It was easier, simpler, to be repentant. His repentance did not accuse him as a man who had sinned, but denounced the things which had caused him to sin and made him unclean. To himself he was essentially perfect. There were forces, however, which infringed upon his perfection, which soiled his fine qualities. Eating his waffle, he thought of the creature with whom he had spent the night, of the dismal bedroom, the frowsy-smelling hallway, the coarse talk and viciousness of the entire business and he began to feel a rage against them. He would like to wipe such things out of the world. He managed to answer Miss Basine politely. "'I've been out of town a great deal,' he said. "'George always said you were a gadfly,' Fanny replied. Mrs. Basine spoke. "'You look rather tired, George.' She gazed pensively at her son. I don't like you to stay out all night like that. Basine frowned. What did his mother mean by that? Did she suppose he had spent the night in debauchery? It sounded that way from the way she looked and talked. 
Basine grew angry. He did not want his mother to accuse him. You don't expect a man to remain cooped up night and day, do you? Oh, I don't mind your going out, but not the way you did last night. She looked at him, and then, as if realizing for the first time the presence of her daughters, changed her manner. Won't you have some syrup, Mr. Keegan? Keegan thanked her and lowered his eyes. He had understood her accusation and accepted it as authentic. He had no mother of his own, and this inspired in him a curious sense of obedience toward all mothers he encountered. Mrs. Basine's accusation embarrassed him. The embarrassment increased his disgust for the memory of the night. He would like to wipe out such obscene and vulgar things. He would like to burn them up, forbid them. Some day he would. Basine, however, regarded his mother with a sense of outrage. The fact that her surmise of what he had done during the night was correct was a matter of minor importance. She didn't know what he had done, and therefore she had no right to guess. He answered her angrily. I did nothing at all last night that I wouldn't have my sisters do. His mother looked at him in surprise. Keegan blushed. You're always hinting around, mother, about things, and you're absolutely wrong. Absolutely, he added for a clincher. His eyes remained unflinchingly on his mother. There was a convincing air of virtue about him, and a doubt entered her mind. Perhaps she had suspected him unjustly. But he had been away all night. She had heard him come in around six. Where could he have been if not in such places? Yet she felt like apologizing. Basine fiddled with his food. He was acting out the part of injured innocence. He was an unprotesting martyr to the low suspicions of his family. The fact that he was guilty in no way interfered with the sincerity of his injured feelings. His mother's accusation had sincerely hurt him, even more than it would had he been actually innocent of wrongdoing. He transferred whatever emotional guilt he had into indignation toward his accuser. This was an old trick of his, developed early in childhood, a faculty of committing crimes without becoming a criminal. More than Keegan, he was above self-accusation. But, unlike Keegan, the doing of a thing he knew to be wrong did not inspire him with the adroit remorse which took the form of hating the thing he had done instead of himself. The crimes Basine committed, usually no greater than normal violations of the ethical code to which he subscribed, were things that had nothing to do with the real Basine. The real Basine was the Basine whom people knew. The real Basine was a characterization he maintained for the benefit of others. The crimes were his own secret. People didn't know them. Therefore, they did not exist. They remained locked away. He did not say to himself, Hypocrite! Liar! When he denied his mother's accusation, he did not, of course, forget the things he had done during the night. In fact, even while he spoke, there came to him a vivid memory of the prostitute. In disproving the existence of this memory, he was not disproving it for himself, but for his mother. His energy, as usual, was bent toward presenting a certain Basine for the admiration of another. The Basine he sought to create for the admiration of his family was a moral and honest man. When they seemed inclined to challenge this creation, their suspicions angered him. His attitude was that of a creator toward a hostile critic. He frequently lost his temper and denounced their suspicions as unjust, unfair. And in his mind, conveniently clouded by indignation, they were. Not to himself as he was, but to the self he insisted upon pretending at the moment he was. 
This self was the Basine he was continually creating, a Basine that was not based upon deeds or truths or facts, but upon ideals. It was an ideal Basine, a nobly edited version of his character. He believed in this ideal Basine with a curious passion. This ideal Basine was a mixture of lies, shams, perversions of fact. But that was only when you considered him in relation to his creator, to its original. In his own mind, it was as absurd to consider this ideal Basine in relation to its creator as it would have been for a critic of aesthetics to consider the merits of Oscar Wilde's poetry in relation to the degeneracy of the man. Considered by himself, the ideal Basine was a person of inspiring virtues. He was proud of the things he pretended to be, vicious in their defense, unswerving in his efforts to inspire others with an appreciation of these pretenses. His anger toward his mother ebbed as he noticed the doubt come into her manner. She had hesitated for a moment in face of significant facts, in accepting the ideal Basine. But her son's sincerity had convinced her as it convinced most people who knew him. The sincerity with which he defended the idealization of himself was easily to be mistaken for a sincerity inspired by an innocence of actual wrongdoing. As soon as he felt certain he had re-established the ideal Basine in his mother's eyes, all thoughts of the facts passed from him. The admiring opinion of others was what his nature desired and what his energies worked for. Once obtained, this admiration was a mirror in which he saw himself only as he had argued others into seeing him. He looked at his friend Keegan with a smile. Keegan was still blushing. Keegan knew that he had lied and that the entire pose was a sham but this only added another thrill to the fleeting self-satisfaction of having re-established himself in his family's eyes. He enjoyed the knowledge that Keegan was able to see what a successful liar he was and how adroitly he managed to deceive people. This enjoyment was not a part of the emotion of the ideal Basine. It was purely human sensation felt by Basine, the creator. There was a single flaw in his little triumph. This was, as usual, the attitude of his sister Doris. While the others were chattering, Doris kept silent. She had dark eyes and black hair. She was entirely unlike anybody in the Basine family. Fanny was blonde and vivacious, with a pout and full red lips. Before the death of her husband, Mrs. Basine had summed up her daughter Doris as being aristocratic. At fifteen, Doris had been painfully shy. People smiled encouragingly at her because she seemed afraid of them. Four years later, people ceased to smile at her. They looked at her out of the corners of their eyes and wondered what she was thinking about. Her silence was like a confusing argument. Had it not been for her beauty, her silence could easily have been dismissed. But her dark eyes and dark hair, the slightly lowered pose of her oval face, and the unvarying line of her fresh lips, with the little sensual bulges at their corners, drew the attention of people. And their attention drawn, they waited to be told something. So merely because she told nothing, they fancied she had a great deal to tell. They attributed to her silence all the doubts they had concerning themselves. Silence was to them always accusation. Her brother's attitude toward Doris was typical. He detested her and yet was more pleased when she nodded at something he said than when others were loud with acclaim. He detested her because she made him feel she was his superior. In what way she was superior he didn't know, and why he felt it he couldn't understand. 
but he sensed she was someone who had no respect for the ideal Basine and no particular love for his creator. She had also a way of deflating him. He felt sometimes as a toy balloon might feel in the presence of a child with a pin. He never ignored her. He watched her always and studied her carefully. He did not desire to please her, but he felt that until he had perfected the ideal Basine to a point where he would be acceptable to Doris, admired by Doris, his creation would be lacking in something vital. As the breakfast came to an end, her brother focused upon Doris. This was invariably the effect of her silence. She was as yet unconscious of it. Had you asked her why she spoke so little, and why she neither smiled nor frowned at people, she would have thought a while, and then with a shrug replied, Why, I hadn't noticed. Later, when she was alone, she would have continued thinking of the question, and perhaps said to herself, It must be because they don't interest me. They seem so silly and unreal. What are you doing today? Basine asked her. She answered, Nothing. He noticed she failed to add, Why? He resented her lack of curiosity. Fanny would have said, Nothing, why do you ask? But Fanny was a good fellow, a lively, amusing child. Mrs. Gilchrist and Aubrey are coming over later, Mrs. Basine announced. She makes me tired. Fanny smiled. And somebody ought to pull dear Aubrey's nose just to see if he's really alive. He's too dignified. Her brother nodded. Do you know him? Fanny asked Keegan. Slightly, said Keegan. I've read one or two of his books. They're very interesting. He paused, hoping that everyone agreed with him. Everyone did, except Doris. "'What's the matter, Dory? Don't you like Aubrey's works?' her brother asked. Doris smiled vaguely. "'I've never read anything he's written,' she said. "'I don't know.' Keegan looked at her uncomfortably. He felt he disliked her, and he would have been pleased to ignore her but the fact that she seemed to have anticipated him in this respect, and to have ignored him first, piqued him. "'I think Judge Smith and Henrietta will be over later,' Basine addressed his mother. Judge Smith was the august and senior partner of the law firm that had taken young Basine into its office. "'Yes, Aubrey told me,' Mrs. Basine said casually. I think they're engaged. Who, Henrietta? From Fanny. Her mother nodded. She stood up, and the group sauntered into the living room. Keegan approached Fanny. Her freshness made him feel sad. Let's sit here, Fanny whispered as he drew near her. She employed the whisper frequently. It usually brought a gleam into the eyes of her vis-a-vis, -vis, as if she had promised something. To appear to promise something was Fanny's chief object in life. It was the basis of her growing popularity. The two sat down in a corner of the room, secluded from the others. Keegan had interested her. At least his far-away, unappraising look had interested her. She preferred men more appraising and less far away. Her object now was to reduce her brother's friend to an admirer. Admirers bored her, but the process of converting strangers, particularly far away and unappraising strangers, into admirers was diverting. Keegan had other plans. A desire to repent aloud had been growing in Keegan. The girl's bright face and virginal air had been inspiring him. He wanted to tell her how unclean he was, and how ashamed of the things he had done. 
He wanted to denounce sin. He felt tired. Fanny talked and he listened. He wanted to weep. He thought her fingers were beautiful and white. He would have liked to kneel beside her weeping, his head against her, and her cool white fingers running over his face. It would be a sort of absolution, a maternal absolution. In the meantime, his silence piqued her. "'You don't seem very interested in what I'm saying,' she interrupted herself. She looked at him, and instinct supplied her with a new attack. "'Where were you and George last night?' she asked. "'Mother was furious about it.' Keegan looked sad. His blonde face collapsed. "'Men are awful rotters,' he answered, lowering his voice. "'Oh, I don't know. Not all men.' "'Yes, all men,' savagely. "'Why do you say that?' "'Because—' Keegan hesitated. Mysterious impulses were operating behind his talk. The night's debauch had sickened him. He was experiencing that depressing type of virtue which usually comes as a reaction from an orgy. His indignation at the bestiality of the male and the moral rottenness of life was a vindication of the temporary weakened state the night had induced in him. By denouncing sex, he excused the disturbing absence of it in himself. He was, however, not content to vindicate the absence in himself of sensual excitement. He would also make use of his lassitude by translating the enervation it produced into self-ennobling emotions, into purity, innate and triumphant. He experienced high-minded ideas and an exaltation of spirit. "'Because,' he repeated, finding it difficult to choose words sufficiently emasculated to reflect the phenomenal purity of his mind. Well, if women knew, they would never talk to men. But women are so good, that is, decent women, that they simply don't understand, and can't understand, what it is. About bad men? Fanny whispered. Keegan nodded. "'And are all men bad?' she asked. Again Keegan nodded, this time more sadly. It was a nod of confession and purity. In it he felt his obscene past and his pious future embrace each other, one whispering, "'Forgive!' and the other whispering, "'Yes, yes, all is forgiven.' Tears warmed his throat. Fanny's eyes looked at him with an odd excitement. Her mind was, as always, conveniently blank of thought. Thoughts would have served only to embarrass and handicap her. She was able to enjoy herself more easily without thinking. It was a ruse which enabled her to regard herself as a clean-minded girl. Young men had frequently taken advantage of her kindness and grown bold. They would, during a tender embrace, sometimes take liberties, or draw her close and press themselves against her. It was at this point that her mind would awake like a burglar alarm suddenly set off. It rang and clanged, an outraged and intimidating ding-dong of virtuous platitudes which she had incongruously rigged up in the sensual warmth of her nature. But lately the mechanism by which she routed her would-be seducers did not quite satisfy her. At twenty she had grown fearful. When she was younger the men she led on were no more than boys. The mechanism had sufficed for them. But the last two years had witnessed a change in her would-be seducers. They had grown up, these males. She remembered, always uncomfortably, a young man who had burst into laughter during her outraged denunciation of him. He had said to her, "'Listen, girl, if I wanted you, 
all i would have to do is tell you to shut up and slap your face and you would your how dare you don't go with me i've known too many girls like you but i don't want you not after this if it'll do you any good i'll tell you now that i won't forget you for a long time whenever i want a good laugh i'll think of you there's a name for your kind and he had used a phrase that nauseated her the incident had occurred on a sunday evening in the hallway he had reached up taken his hat from the rack and without further comment walked out fanny had spent the night weeping with shame the memory of the young man's words made spooning impossible for a month she was essentially an honest person and unable to do a thing she knew was wrong her only hope of pleasing herself and indulging her growing sensuality lay in remaining sincerely oblivious to what she was doing as long as the man's words stuck in her memory it was impossible to remain oblivious they had awakened no line of reasoning or self-accusation in her mind her mind was still conveniently blank. The youth's denunciation lay like a foreign substance in it, a substance which, fortunately, time was able to dissolve. After a month of embittered virtue, Fanny returned warily to her former tactics. She was cautious enough to begin with men as young as herself. One night in April she gave her lips again they had been making candy in the kitchen she turned the light out as they were leaving the young man stood in front of her in the dark his arms went shyly around her with a satisfied thrill she shut her eyes and allowed the boy to kiss her a languor overcame her she ran her fingers through his thick hair and gently pressed closer to him the warning sounded sooner than usual, and in a surprising way. It came from within this time. The boy had not grown bold. He was enjoying her lips shyly, and his embrace was almost that of a dancing partner. Nevertheless, the burglar alarm clang-clanged. Her body had grown hot. The impulse to crush herself against the boy, to open her mouth, to embrace him fiercely throbbed in her and bewildering sensations were bursting unsatisfactory warmths in her blood she hesitated she might secretly yield to these demands he would remain unaware of it and there would be no danger but the alarm finally penetrated the fog of her senses she was unable this time to shut off the current of her passion by the burst of a sudden virtuous anger the mechanism of her retreat had always been simple a trick of turning her sensual excitement into indignation of energizing the virtuous platitudes rigged up in her mind by the passion the caresses had stirred the greater this passion the more violently her pulse beat the more violently the platitudes would clang and the more outraged her how dare you would sound but it was impossible to say anything this time her hands pushed suddenly at the politely amorous youth his embrace skipped from her as if it had been waiting for such a remonstrance she stood with her head whirling she felt limp and ill at ease don't you love me the young man whispered the lameness of his voice would ordinarily have made her smile but now the words seemed to draw her she wanted to answer them to say yes for the moment it seemed as if she must confess she loved this impossible young man she walked quickly out of the dark hallway in the lighted room she was ashamed of herself her body tingled with unaccountable pains she managed to survive the evening without revealing herself. 
she was grateful for the youth's stupidity. When she lay in bed, she closed her eyes firmly and tried to sleep. But her body disturbed her. Sensations that lured and frightened played furtively throughout it. She lay stretching and sighing. Later, overcome with a nervous weariness, she fell asleep. On awaking, she remembered her triumph and felt proud. In retrospect, the sensations she had felt and the temptations that had urged her seemed distasteful. Years before, she had rationalized her behavior toward young men by inventing a code. The code was based on the fact that hugging and kissing and the pleasure these inspired were in no way connected with the other. When she thought of more intimate relations, it was always in some such phrase. She was completely ignorant of the physiological mechanics of marriage. But her ignorance inspired no curiosity. She did not think of it as a logical culmination of the feeling embraces gave her. She had a definite attitude toward the other. It was a thing separated from her numerous experiences by a gulf. There was only one bridge across, marriage. Keegan interested her. Since the incident of the embarrassed young man with whom she had made candy in the kitchen, she had been secretly on the lookout for someone like him. She wanted someone with whom she could repeat the startling experience of that other evening without letting herself into danger. Someone who would remain oblivious to the passion his caresses aroused, and so allow her to enjoy slyly the sensations whose memory had never left her. She looked around the room. Doris had gone upstairs, and George was not to be seen. Her mother was reading behind a large table. "'Tell me, why are men bad?' she asked in a whisper. Her blue eyes were wide. An air of altruistic sorrow surrounded her. She grieved for men. The question appealed to Keegan. His eyes grew moist. He was unable to understand this impulse to weep, but somehow it was pleasant. "'They're not bad,' he answered softly. "'It's only that they don't realize till too late. If all women were like you, there would be no bad men.' "'Oh, then it's the woman's fault?' Keegan nodded, but said, "'Not exactly.' It's like figuring which came first into the world, the egg or the chicken that laid it. It's hard telling whether women are bad because men have made them so, or whether men are bad because women gave them chances to be. That is, that kind of women, you know. He felt elated at his tolerance. A few minutes ago he had been denouncing bad women in his mind but now it pleased him to be broader. Fanny was looking at him with cheeks flushed. Her mother had risen. "'I think I'll go to church,' Mrs. Bazine said. "'Do you want to come along?' "'Not today, mother dear,' Fanny answered. Keegan was on his feet. "'If you want to,' he offered gallantly to the girl. I usually love to, Fanny sighed, but I don't feel quite like it today. You go along, mother. Mrs. Bazine smiled and left the room. Fanny heard her brother talking in the hall. I think I'll go with you, mother. She listened to Keegan in silence, waiting for the outer door to close. Now they were alone except for Doris upstairs. I know how you must feel about it, she said, but I don't understand how a man like you or George can do such things. It must be awful. She paused, blushing, and added in a whisper, Horrible. Keegan nodded and felt overcome as he watched her shudder and draw her shoulders nervously together. 
he covered his face with his hands. This was, he felt, being almost too dramatic to hide his face. But his virtue demanded dramatics. He wanted to talk facts now, confess facts. By denouncing what he had done during the night, he would increase his present emotion of chastity. Don't, he said, let's talk of it. His eyes grew wet again. He was tired. If only life were as clean as this girl he was talking to. If only life were beautiful and chaste, and there were no sex, no sin, men and women, just sweet friends. But life was different. It was full of unclean things. He couldn't help it, what he did. He didn't want to do it. But life surrounded him that way with things unclean. He wept. Fanny hesitated. Her face had grown colored and her nerves were alive. She must do something. Her fingers desired to caress Keegan's hair, and she thought how nice it would be to be kissed by him. But she resolutely barred further thoughts from her mind. It was wrong to think about such things. Fanny's code would allow her to do nothing wrong, if she knew it. She leaned forward impulsively. He was sitting on a window seat. Her hands touched his covered face. "'You mustn't,' she said. He was sorry for life, for its uncleanliness. He would like to go somewhere far away where clean clouds and a beautiful sea were just as God had made them. And there he would like to sit with this girl, their hearts beautifully sad. She stroked his hair shyly with maternal fingers. He felt the caress and his heart melted. Its sin poured out, leaving him exaltedly cleansed. Yes, she understood him the ache of repentance in his soul, the nostalgia for cleanliness that hurt him so. She understood, and she was telling him so with her fingers. "'Poor boy,' she whispered, because he was weeping. "'I'm so sorry. You won't again, ever, will you?' "'No,' Keegan mumbled tremulously. It was easy and exalting to confess and promise in this way, without mentioning anything by name, just by sound. "'I'm so glad,' she whispered, as if they were in church. "'If I have done that for you—' "'You have,' he agreed. "'I feel like a—like a dog.' "'Don't!' Her fingers were playing over his cheek. She could be bold. A man in tears was harmless. She stood up with determination and sat down close beside him. She took his head in her hands, and looking with clear understanding eyes into his, shook her head sadly. "'You need a rest,' she whispered. "'Here, rest like this.' She placed his head as if he were a child on her shoulder. Keegan's heart contracted with remorse at the innocence of the gesture. Her purity was something poignant. He closed his eyes and drifted into an innocuous satisfaction. This was a realization of his hopes for purity. He recalled with bitterness the filthy embraces of the night. How superior this was! How much cleaner! "'Wait a minute,' Fanny murmured a wholesome, matter-of-fact maternalism in her voice. You lie down and rest, like this. She assumed the proprietary gestures remembered from her childhood when she had played house with little boys and girls and guided Keegan to stretch his legs on the window seat. He grinned apologetically. Fanny sat down and placed his head in her lap, her hands gently caressing his hair. "'Now sleep,' she murmured. "'There's nobody in the house, and you can get a good long rest.' Keegan shut his eyes. A blissful enervation stole over him. 
his heart felt grateful. She was like a mother might be. Everyone had a mother except him. "'You're so kind,' he sighed. He had known Fanny for several months only, and had never talked to her alone before. But now, it seemed to him, she was his oldest and most intimate friend. Because she understood. He thought of her as a companion of his better self. The warmth of her lap soothed him. Unaware, he dropped into a half-doze. The man's head lying heavily against her body began to stir her senses. She made certain first that he was not pressing himself against her. No, he was merely lying naturally. A tenderness grew in her heart. She murmured to herself, Poor boy, poor boy. This wasn't quite as it had been in the kitchen that evening. The murmur continued as her face grew flushed, and she breathed unevenly. She wanted to stretch and sigh. Keegan stirred. A fear came that he realized her sensations. He was playing possum. No. She watched his eyes open and noted their stare of filmy tenderness. "'You're so sweet,' he whispered. She smiled pitifully at him and said, "'Rest, just rest. I feel so sorry for you.' In fact, imposed upon the excitement which the pressure of his head against her aroused, was a feeling of Samaritan pity. However, she wondered without displacing this emotion of altruistic concern for the young man, how far she dared go. She wished that his hands would touch her, but they would have to stand up for that. Oh! She moved Keegan's head gently away. I thought I heard someone. Slipping to her feet, she stared eagerly toward the door. Keegan straightened himself. He looked at her drowsily. It's no one, she smiled. Her eyes covered him with tender interest. He thought of some picture of a saint, St. Cecilia, or someone like that. "'Why don't you go up in George's room?' she asked. She gave him her hand as if to assist him in a comradely way to rise. He stood up slowly. "'You don't know what you've done for me,' he began. "'You're so different, so good.' She smiled and made a pretense of assisting him further by passing her arm gently around him. "'I don't know what it is,' he murmured. He stopped. His heart was hurting him with longing. He was unclean. But this beautiful saint would cleanse him, purify him. She was a part of life he desired, the clean things. But he was afraid. How could he after last night? How could he dare? She would certainly misunderstand if he touched her. She would think he was a scoundrel. Fanny, he whispered. She looked at him with intensely tender eyes, as a mother might regard a forgiven child. He embraced her, his hands resting only lightly on her back. Forgive me, he mumbled. But everything's so rotten. I feel like such a cad after what I've done. You, you make me almost happy again. His mind was pleasantly fogged. He was thinking of himself as a despicable sinner receiving mysterious absolution. She said nothing but let herself come closer. She was adroit, and he remained unaware that she had pressed herself tautly against him. He was concerned entirely with the purity of his caress. He read in her eyes and flushed face a forgiveness, an absolution. Her grip on him that had grown firm was the grip of a woman raising him out of the hell in which he had wallowed. His senses, deadened by debauch, 
failed to detect the pressure of her clinging. She could dare. An intensity came slowly into her nerves. She would like to move, to crush herself against him. But she managed to restrain herself. She began to weep. Don't, he whispered. You mustn't. I'm... I'm not as bad as all that. She managed to say, Oh, I feel so sorry for you. It just hurts me to... to think of you like that. Promise me you'll never again. Please, promise me. Promise me. Her words, despite her, grew wild. She raised her eyes feverishly and, tightening her arms, pressed herself to him. The man's harmlessness had betrayed her. She continued to weep. Promise me you'll never be bad like that again. Her emotion reaching its depth sent a delicious sense through her. She embraced him for a moment. In the receding fog of her satisfied impulse, she heard him answering, tears in his voice. You're so sweet, so wonderful. Oh, forgive me, I'll never be bad again. Forgive me. End of chapter 3 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 4 of Gargoyles this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Gargoyles by Ben Hecht. Chapter 4 Judge Percival Smith was a fastidious gentleman who boasted of his age as a contrast to his virility. Sixty two, he pronounced impressively, and he would wait for people to look at him in amazement fortunately unaware of the fact that they had thought him at least seventy. His wife had died when he was forty-six. She had never managed to understand him, chiefly because he had remained polite to her through eighteen years of marriage. She had grown to regard him with awe. Her friends always referred to him as a gentleman, a gentleman of the old school. This was because he had a deep voice and enunciated clearly and professed a consistent preference for the days when men were men and women were women. His friends mistook the clarity of his enunciation for a clarity of thought, an error which found social vindication in the fact that he had been on the bench nine years. Aside from his consistent preference, his views on current issues were also those of a gentleman, why, it was difficult to determine, but he supplied their identity himself by clinching his arguments with the question, I don't see, sir, how a gentleman can think otherwise. He was often considered old-fashioned, but he was admired for this. In discussing religion, he would say, I am not one to quibble with my maker or with any of his holy decisions. I believe absolutely in the gospel of infant damnation. A religion with loopholes is not a religion. Either there is a God or there isn't. If there is, and you accept him, then you accept him. You do not argue with him. I don't see, sir, how a gentleman can think otherwise. Concerning women, he would say, Women represent the finer things of life. Not for them the turmoil and strife of economic battle. Their function in the scheme of things is obvious, sir. They were placed in the world by a wise maker in order to bring sweetness, purity, and light to bear upon the strivings of man. A woman's hearthstone is her altar. No, they are not the equal of man. They are his complement. Man is gross. Woman is fine and sweet. I do not believe in any of these disgusting ideas which seek to lower her from the altar she now occupies in the eyes of all gentlemen. 
When he delivered himself of these utterances, he managed always to give to them the certainty of a man who was pronouncing judgments. He was admired for this certainty. People who felt doubts in their minds were always pleased to hear the judge make pronouncements. They felt that it was impossible that a man who spoke so clearly, whose eye looked so unflinchingly at one, and whose manners were so perfect, could be wrong. He might not be quite as modern as some folks, but he knew what he was talking about. He was the stentorian and impressive interpreter to them of a world they understood. The ideas which flourished in this world were in the main dead or dying, but this fact only lent a further impressiveness to them and to him. People who sought to argue with Judge Smith usually ended by stuttering and growing red-faced. They felt, as they talked and watched, his blue eyes narrowing and his lips tightening, that they were talking themselves outside of the pale. His silence became an excommunication. They read ostracism in his frown and began to fumble for words, trying to propitiate him in one breath while presenting their side of the case to him in another. But he was not to be deceived by this ruse. He would sit poised and grimly attentive, like a man judiciously enduring the presence of blasphemy, but under great emotional strain. When they concluded, it was frequently unnecessary for him to offer counter-arguments. His opponents felt their defeat in the knowledge of his superiority, not as a thinker, but his superiority as a man of inviolable standards, his superiority as a gentleman. In eighteen years of close contact, his wife had never penetrated the shell of certitude and personal elegance within which the judge moved. During their hours of intimacy, he revealed himself as a man of normal passions. But even during these, he was solicitous, unbending, and a gentleman. In the morning, dressed, his white napkin tucked under his ruddy face, he would be again Judge Smith. She had tried several times early in their marriage to carry the intimacy of the bedroom to the breakfast table. He had listened to her endearments and furtive reminiscences at such moments with eyes seemingly incapable of comprehending, and she had felt each time that her talk was obscene and grown frightened. Her death brought no perceptible change in Judge Smith's life. He continued a gentleman. His name appeared at intervals in the newspapers as having gone to Washington to argue a case before the Supreme Court. His friends felt on reading this that the Supreme Court was an institution perfectly fitted to him. It was hard to imagine anybody but a man who looked and acted like Judge Smith arguing a case in the Supreme Court. The Smith home, a brownstone house in Prairie Avenue, was occupied by the judge, his daughter Henrietta, and a housekeeper. Henrietta had finished boarding school at nineteen. She had since then busied herself as an assistant housekeeper. At twenty-one she impressed people with being as naive and fresh as a girl of seventeen. It was hard to think of her as in her twenties. She was a round-eyed, round-faced child with fluffy blonde hair, a small-boned body, and a general air of juvenile fragility. She talked very little, but bubbled with exclamations of delight, excitement, enthusiasm, astonishment. These she was continually employing, regardless of their incongruity. She greeted people with delight, saying, "'Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Isn't it wonderful?' and managed to scatter a dozen exclamation marks through the sentences. If one said to her, "'Did you see Southern and Marlowe last week?' she replied excitedly, "'Oh, no, I missed them. I'm so sorry. Aren't they wonderful?' Asked for an opinion of a new hat, she would exude the same exclamation marks in, Oh, it's simply too adorable for words. I'm just mad about it. 
and to such remarks as, I read in the paper the other day that President Roosevelt went fishing, she would offer a wide-eyed stare and exclaim, overcome with astonishment, Why, gracious, is that so? Isn't that awfully funny? And incomprehensibly she would laugh as if overcome with mirth. People regarded her as a charmingly vivacious, well-mannered girl. Her exclamations pleased them by lending an importance to their small talk, a small talk which constituted nearly the whole of their conversational lives. Her explosive banalities invigorated them. They said of her, Judge Smith's daughter is so alive. She's so fresh and young and so enthusiastic. Henrietta thought her father the greatest and most important man in the world. She called him father, stressing the first syllable in a manner that distinguished him from all other fathers. Her admiration satisfied the judge. He demanded of her only obedience, respect, and chastity. Since she gave him these, he looked upon her as a shining example of true womanhood. To have searched for an inner life in Henrietta would have been difficult. She was unaware of any other Henrietta than the surface she presented. There was no secret calculation behind her manner. Her body, at twenty-one, was still as undisturbed by desires as her mind was by thought. She was physically and mentally vacuous, and the words that sometimes ran in her mind were parodings of things she had heard. Her days passed in a pleasant maze of trifles in which she exhausted her energies. Her manner of enthusiasm and astonishment was sincere. In her exaggerated exclamations, the energies of her youth merely found a necessary and utterly respectable outlet. Her banalities were too vigorous to be aught but authentic and original. They were the enviably correct flower of her personality. The judge, however, had a side to his nature generally unsuspected among his friends. He was a drinker. He owed the resonant slowness of his speech, in fact, to the ravages of drink. His poise, his intimidating deliberateness, were likewise the result of drink. His mind had been somewhat enervated, and the spontaneity of his nerves somewhat impaired by thirty years of intensive drinking. His words followed his thoughts slowly, and his gestures were moments behind the commands of his brain centers. This general slowing up, the result of nerve exhaustion induced by his orgies, was readily accepted by his friends as an impressiveness of manner. In arguments he found himself frequently unable to follow the nimble phrases of an opponent. His resort to silence, a silence made seemingly pregnant by certain mannerisms, such as tightening of his lips, a drawing down of his nose, and a narrowing of his eyes, which were actually an effort to ward off a sleepiness continually hovering over him, this silence was a successful substitute. Mainly the judge kept his orgies to himself. During his married life he had adroitly covered them up as business trips, cases in other cities. His habit was to start off at his club, to sit among a half dozen men whose type he found agreeable, and drink slowly during the early part of the evening. The talk would gradually veer from politics and legal discussions to women and anecdotes. In these the judge excelled. His fund of obscene stories was amazing. He related them with relish, and was proud of an ability to talk several dialects, such as German, Irish, Yiddish, Scotch, and Swedish. Among his club cronies, his drinking and alcoholic waggery in no way reflected upon his status as a gentleman of absolute respectability and discretion. In fact, they enhanced it. Among the judge's friends were lawyers of repute, financiers, 
and owners of large manufacturing plants. They were men usually past fifty. Their comradeship was based chiefly on their recognition of each other's prestige. The publicity that had attended their lives gave them all an identical stamp, a self-consciousness. They felt themselves instinct with power, and bent the greater part of their social energies to appearing democratic. They desired, as much as they desired anything, the flattery which lay in the comment, Oh, he's very democratic, just plain ordinary folks. They felt an exciting inference in this criticism. The inference was that, considering their power and superiority, one had to marvel at the fact of their dissimulation, their democracy. Thus they relished always lending themselves to projects, to situations which earned for them the odd avowal of inferiors, that they were just folks. A certain shrewdness as well as flattery which inspired them. They were aware that people often preferred confessing the superiority of their betters by admitting in awe that, after all, he's just like us in many respects. On occasions, when a group of them gathered at their club, they stepped partly out of the characterizations of great men which they affected during most of their day. Drinking, taking their turns telling stories, or pointing up incidents by the Did you ever hear the one about the Swede who went to a picnic with his best girl? method, they always welcomed Judge Smith. They were inclined to overlook a few things in his favor. If he did seem to have an unnecessary fund of smutty tales, there was on the other hand the fact that he was a judge, and therefore above the anecdotes he told. Like the judge, they too were men with firmly rooted convictions on the subject of morality, and if they laughed at stories over their highballs that flouted decency and made a mock of virtue, there was this exonerating factor to be considered. Men sure of themselves and subscribing unflinchingly to the uncompromising standards of conduct necessary to maintain the morale of the community, such men could without danger unbend among themselves. For morality was in its deepest sense the protection of others and not of oneself. As the group thinned out on such occasions, Judge Smith would rise, and in the manner of a man returning to the higher and more important duties of life, bid his fellows good night. A very pleasant evening, gentlemen, he would pronounce, but duty calls. He would bow stiffly. Long drinking had made him master to an astonishing point of his physical being while under the influence of drink. Bowing, he would walk with dignity from the room, emerge into the street, and enter one of the cabs. A half hour later would find him disporting himself in one of his favorite disorderly houses. Here, with the aid of further drink, the judge became a curious spectacle. He was generally hailed in the places that knew him as the wild old boy and his arrival, although greeted with enthusiasm, was a matter of secret chagrin to the landladies of his acquaintance. It was his habit to indulge in filthy insults, hurling astounding obscenities at the half-drunken inmates. He would frequently become violent and throw bottles around, break mirrors and electric bulbs, and smash chairs. It was difficult to grow angry with him at such times, because he covered his violences and insults with a continuous roar of laughter, as if they were actually the product of a vast Rabelaisian good humor. His insults, the obscene invective he hurled at the partners in his orgy, were a curious phase. They were the product of a process of projection. His normal mind, still alive under the paralysis of alcohol, pronounced these outraged denunciations of his behavior against himself. His virtue and decency cried a savage disgust, and he must rid himself of these cries, 
find an outlet for his self-revulsions, if he desired to continue the debauch, which was also an outlet for things inside him, things that slept too violently under the repressions of his shell. Thus he rationalized his two selves by giving voice to the terrific protests of his virtue. Simultaneously, he hid himself from their object by fastening the insults that poured into his thought upon those around him. The women explained among each other in their own words that he was a filthy old man and ought to be ashamed of himself. End of chapter 4 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 5 of Gargoyles this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Gargoyles by Ben Hecht. Chapter 5 It was afternoon. Mrs. Bazine listened to Judge Smith explaining the new moving pictures that were being shown at the vaudeville theaters. It's all part of the craze for new things, he was saying and these awful pictures are merely a fad. There is nothing of basic appeal for Americans in them, and they'll die out in a year or so. Mrs. Bazine was always impressed by the judge. He had three days before been on one of his debauches. His manner, as a result, was heavier and his words slower. After one of his wild nights, the judge sought to efface the memory of the uncleanliness by heightening his personal appearance. He would indulge himself in Turkish baths, facial massages, hair shampoos, manicures, and changes of linen during the day. The sight of himself immaculately dressed, spotless, his face, collar, nails, and shoes shining, gave him a feeling of reassurance. Clothes and appearance had more and more become a fetish with him until he had developed into a fop. There was a certain passion in his demand for cleanliness. A disordered tie would mysteriously depress him. A spot on his trousers or shoes would preoccupy him until its removal. Once, while on his way from the theater, he had been splashed by a horse. Unaware of the accident at the time, he had gone to a restaurant. There he had noticed the condition of his clothes. The mud had reached as high as his shoulder. A nausea overcame him. He hurried to the lavatory and cleaned his clothes. His daughter admired her father for his fastidiousness. She looked upon all other men as somewhat sloppy in comparison. It isn't just that father dresses well, she said, but he's so particular about everything, about his plates and forks, and his bedroom must be bright as a new pin. Oh, it's just wonderful for a man to be thoroughly clean like that. Although the judge had spoken to Mrs. Bazine, it was her son who answered. I saw the pictures at the vaudeville the other evening, he said, and I quite agree with you, judge. The judge nodded pleasantly. He liked Bazine and had already prophesied a future for him. Henrietta was informing Doris of the trouble they were having with the church choir. Dr. Blossom, she was saying, is just absolutely at his wit's end. We can't get anybody, anybody at all that's at all suitable. Mrs. Gilchrist and Aubrey are coming over, Mrs. Bazine remarked to the judge. She was unable to keep a sound of pride out of her voice. "'A very fine woman, an exceptionally fine woman,' he answered. Mrs. Bazine nodded. Bazine sat down beside his sister, Doris. He was interested in Henrietta. The news of her approaching engagement had exhilarated this interest. He had been a half-hearted wooer himself when he first came out of college. As she rattled on, he was thinking, She has nice eyes. She probably doesn't love Aubrey. He thought of Aubrey, a putty-faced, swell-headed fool. 
He could put it all over him, even as a writer, if he wanted to. "'I hear,' he said aloud, "'that you and Aubrey are engaged, or almost engaged.' "'Why, the idea! Gracious!' a disturbed giggle. "'Where on earth did you hear that? Father hasn't announced it yet.' "'A little bird,' smiled Basine. Doris looked at him and frowned. "'What do you say we pop some corn?' he announced. One of Basine's most engaging facilities was an ability to reflect in his own words and actions the character of those to whom he talked. Judge Smith regarded him as a young man of stable ideas and profound seriousness. Henrietta looked upon him as a charming, light-hearted youth who was able to play. There were others to whom he appealed separately as a young man of culture, modern to his fingertips, as a man of pious kindliness, as a man interested exclusively in politics, in economics, in literature, in women. His pose was seemingly at the mercy of his audience. He did not deliberately seek to make himself agreeable by presenting exteriors acceptable to his friends. His proteanism was in the main unconscious. It was the result of an underlying desire to impress men and women he knew with his superiority. He had found instinctively that a short cut to such impression was not contradictions but agreement. He would not merely say yes and please his listener by subscribing wholeheartedly to the ideas or points of view under discussion. He would take these ideas and points of view and develop them, show with a sincere creative enthusiasm why they were correct and how astoundingly correct they were. He was usually cleverer than the people with whom he agreed. This made it possible for him to develop their ideas, to add to them, supply them with nuances and far-reaching overtones of which their originators had had no inkling. When he had finished, they would find themselves warmly applauding what he had said, admiring his sanity and intelligence. It was no longer Basine who agreed with them. They agreed with Basine, and each of them went away, saying, A remarkable young man, full of very fine, worthwhile ideas, and able to express himself. They were conscious, while praising him, that they were also praising themselves. Although they were unaware of the adroit theft committed by Basine, and unable to follow the way in which he filched their little prejudices, and inflated them to noble proportions with his cleverness, they felt a kinship with the young man. Their inferior egoism did not demand recognition as collaborator. They were warmed with the emotion of being en rapport with someone whom they admired. So often clever people were people with whom, somehow, one had little or nothing in common. But Basine was a clever person with whom everyone seemingly had everything in common, and they were delighted to have things in common with a clever man. There were occasions on which Basine's cleverness was put to a difficult test. These came when a number of people, each of whom knew him differently, to each of whom he had identified himself as a champion of divergent opinions, assembled in his presence. Basine, it usually happened, was the friend in common, and therefore the pivot of the vague debates which sometimes started the awkward exchange of half-remembered arguments which constituted the intellectual life of his friends, as the make-believe of playing house had constituted their adult life when they were children. But at such times Basine revealed his interesting talents as a compromiser, fence-straddler, pacifier. Without espousing any of the sides presented, without denial or affirmation, he managed to convince the assemblage that he was a champion of all and detractor of none. He pretended a worldly tolerance, saying such things as, Well, now, there are always two sides to a question. 
and a man who closes his mind to either side is likely as not to find himself in the dark. What Henning says is interesting. I can entirely understand it and see the reasons for it. He sees the thing in a clear, definite manner. Yet what Stoffel says is also interesting, and, of course, entertaining. I don't mean that I believe two sides to a question can both be the right sides, but it's my experience that there's an element of truth as well as of error in both sides. And I'm not so convinced that Henning and Stoffel actually differ. Often people meaning the same thing get into violent arguments because they misunderstand each other. In this way he would convince both his friends that they were both men of intelligence which is more flattering than being merely men of intelligent views. And, what was more important, he would give the listeners the impression of a calm, deliberative Basine, not to be taken in by the tricks of prejudice and speech which caused men to knock their heads together in endless argument. Henrietta accompanied him into the kitchen in quest of corn to pop. Doris remained behind, staring disinterestedly at the judge who was talking to her mother. She had noticed something about the man that displeased her. She kept it, however, to herself. When he shook hands with her, he assumed a paternal manner. He said to her, "'Well, my dear child, and how are you today? Serious as ever, I see. I understand that you and my little girl had quite an interesting time at the choir practice Saturday evening. Dear me, you will both soon be grown up and young ladies before I'm aware of it. He talked with a kittenish banter in his voice, as if he were patting a child of five on the head. But he held her hand during his entire speech, and his soft fingertips pressed moistly into her palm. It was hard at first to detect but after a long time Doris understood. Fanny had told her in an unsolicited confession that young men did that when they wanted to be familiar with a girl. It was a familiarity which only bad girls understood. Fanny added that a number of nice men whom she never would have suspected of such a low thing had done that to her hand, but that the way to get the better of them was merely to pretend you didn't know anything about it. Doris, disgusted by her sister's chatter, had remembered Judge Smith. The judge always did that, moving his fingertips as if he were unaware of the fact. This afternoon he had done it again. She had never been able to see the judge as her mother and brother saw him. To Doris there was something intangibly repulsive about his flabby, smooth-shaven face about his shining linen and deliberate manner that impressed everybody. She did not resent the things he said. To these she was, in fact, indifferent. But the man's personality awakened a revulsion in her. She did not explain it to herself. She was aware only that she felt uncomfortable when he looked at her, and that when he beamed his kindliest or boomed most virtuously, she felt like sinking lower in her chair and contorting her face with shame, not for herself, but for him. Basine and Henrietta had returned to the room. A great fire was burning wanly. Basine, squatting down like an elated boy, arranged a cushion for her. "'Oh, we've forgotten the thingamabob!" he exclaimed. "'Come help me find that!' Henrietta skipped excitedly after him. Moments like this were dear to Henrietta, looking for thingamabobs, planning popcorn feasts, having lots of fun, and in a way that was intelligent. In the kitchen, Basine searched for a minute, and then turned to the girl with a laugh. "'I wanted to ask you something,' he said. "'That's why I lured you out again.' "'For heaven's sake! Gracious!' Aren't you ashamed of yourself, George Basine?" She laughed with him. The thought had secured to him that it would be interesting to take Henrietta away from Aubrey. He didn't want her himself for any particular purpose, 
she was not a girl one could seduce or even desired to seduce and marriage was miles from his head yet he had once held her hand while sitting on her father's porch and whispered idiotic things to her he had made love to her said to her henny dear i'm wild about you it annoyed him to think that aubrey gilchrist would marry her would appropriate her as if things he basine had said and done were of no possible consequence in addition he had always disliked aubrey henny he said quickly he had called her henny two years before are you really in love with aubrey henrietta made a face and swung her shoulders like a child embarrassed like keegan he was physically tired from his night's debauch but in basine there was no impulse to repent as he stood looking at the girl he grew curiously sensual in his thought the consciousness of his deadened nerves was an irritant to his vanity he was always doing things he felt disinclined to do as a result of his constant work of idealization also to follow one's impulse and act logically was what everyone did in a way if hugh keegan was tired he sighed and said so but basine if he was tired would laugh and suggest adventures if keegan or the others he knew were elated over something they announced it naively like children but basine edited his elation and often pretended to be bored and when he was actually bored he often pretended enthusiasm such odd perversions had become a habit with basine behind the confusion of purpose that inspired them was a certainty that in acting the way he did he distinguished himself from other people often no one was aware of course that he was acting that his enthusiasm was the heroic mask of weariness but basine was enough of an egoist to enjoy secretly the emotion of superiority because he was tired and because he would have preferred ignoring the trim figure laughing beside him he deliberately took her hand and allowed his smile to grow serious now as he looked at her and saw her eyes soften his vanity clamored for satisfaction it was one of the moments in his life when his vanity most desired satisfaction proof of the high opinions he held of himself he was tired bored and without impulses to dominate others to possess himself of their regard and homage was the goal toward which he always built now the desire to possess himself of the regard and homage of the girl whose hand he was holding came acutely into his thought henny he whispered i'm sorry about you and aubrey why this was the sort of boy and girl scene at which she was almost adept people held hands and even kissed without altering the correct social tone or content of their talk because said basine oh well because i love you the phrase stirred as it always did a faint emotion in his heart he had used it frequently even with prostitutes and it had always given him a fugitive sense of exultation walking alone in the street at night he would sometimes whisper aloud i love you george oh i love you so he would have no one in mind whom he might be quoting at the moment the words would come and utter themselves and give him a sudden lift of spirit it was like his other self-conversation when walking along swiftly in the street he would begin exclaiming under his breath wonderful 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 the word like his mysterious i love you george came without cause or relation to his thoughts and repeated itself on his lips henrietta was staring at him it was chiefly because she was surprised she remembered that they had been friends once and held hands and that he had said things 
but all that had been a part of a pretty game one played with boys, because they liked it, and because it was rather likable in itself. She was surprised now because he looked sad. Sadness, in her mind, was synonymous with seriousness. People were never serious unless they were sad. When she wanted to be serious, she would always lower her eyes and arrange her expression as if she were going to weep. Then people understood that what she said was really truly serious and not just part of the game people were always playing among themselves. A game in which nothing was serious or funny or anything, but just was. Because that was the way it should be. Basine was pulling her slowly toward him. "'Don't you love me?' he asked. "'Don't you love me at all?' He was talking aloud to conceal the fact that he had drawn her to him and was placing his arms around her. To do anything like that in silence would have frightened Henrietta. But to talk while one was doing it, that made it seem less definite. One could ignore what one was doing, ignore the hands pressing one's shoulders and the touching of bodies by pretending to interest oneself entirely in the conversation. Basine knew this because he had made love to girls and taken liberties. As long as he kept talking and asking questions, the girl would pretend she was so occupied in answering the questions and keeping up socially her end of the talk that she was oblivious to the liberties that were being taken with her. Henrietta answered, "'Why do you ask that? Do you really think you ought to ask me questions like that, George Basine?' "'Yes, I do,' he said. "'Why shouldn't I?' "'Oh, because. Because you're engaged to Marion.' "'Who told you that?' "'I know. Anybody could know that. Aren't you?' "'No more than you are to Aubrey.' "'Gracious, aren't you the clever boy? I declare. Engaged to Aubrey.' Heavens, I'd like to know where you heard that. A little bird told me. It did not. Yes, it did. You know better than that, George Basine. I wish you'd tell me, really. Why should I? I'd like to know, that's why. I think I have a right to know. Oh, but I did tell you something. I told you I love you. Why, George Basine. During the talk, Basine had moved her closer to him. His arms were tightly around her, and he had kissed her eyes and cheeks between his questions and answers. The embrace had aroused no physical desire in him. He was irritated by the coolness of his nerves. He was irritated at his being unable to feel anything with his arms around a pretty girl. Usually the incident would have reached its climax with the half-kiss he placed on her mouth. That was as far as good girls went. At this point they ordinarily said something like, "'Listen, I want to tell you something. I almost forgot,' and gently detaching themselves from one's arms, continued to talk in the same tone they had used during the embrace about some event that had occurred during the week. And then one returned to the sitting room and went on talking casually as if nothing had happened. It was the height of bad taste to remind a good girl today that one had kissed her yesterday or to presume upon it in any way. It was the height of bad taste also to resist when they gently pushed one away and said, Listen, I want to tell you something. I almost forgot. Basine knew the simple technique of these virginal intrigues. Henrietta's hands were pressing him. This was the signal to release her and pretend that nothing had happened. Ordinarily, Basine would have complied. He had no interest in the girl. His original impulse to take her from Aubrey had slipped from his mind. But he had grown sad. The mild, sensual moment he would usually have experienced in the embrace had been missing. 
his tired nerves had not responded. Unable to exhilarate his senses, he sought to make up for the failure by treating his vanity to an exhilaration. This exhilaration would come if the girl he was holding grew suddenly sad, raised wide eyes to him, and in a shamed voice murmured, I love you, George. Oh, I love you so. He would make her do this. Oh, Henny, why don't you love me? I want you so much all the time. Why, George Bazine! She had suspected something different about the game when it started, and this was different. Even with Aubrey it had not been as different as this. Aubrey's mother and her father had decided upon the engagement after Aubrey had been fussing her for a few weeks. But this was different. George Bazine was in love with her. She had always liked him because her father said he was a fine, promising young man, and because he knew how to play, and was really like herself in many ways. She wondered what she should do. She felt worried because she was afraid she would say something that wasn't right. She couldn't ask him to let her go because he was only holding her lightly, and she could move away if she wanted to. She thought his eyes were sad, and she felt suddenly sorry for him. He had stopped talking, and his eyes were sad. They were looking at her, and they made her feel sad, too. Things were so different when one felt sad. Everything seemed to go away then, and nothing remained. Everything went away and left one a little frightened, as if the world were unreal and everybody was unreal and nothing really was. She was frightened like that now, or at least she thought it was fear. Then she saw it was something else. Her heart had started to pound hard and her throat fluttered inside. No one had ever looked at her like this, so seriously, as if she were somebody very serious. It made her feel strange. She grew dizzy and her arms felt weak. She whispered his name and his hands crept over her cheeks. This thrilled her as if there were electricity in his fingers, and frightened her again. But it was nice, like being a little girl, almost a baby, and falling into an older man's arms, her father's arms. She could almost remember being a little girl and lying in her father's arms. Do you love me? She would answer this time. Yes, she said. Oh, George. She hid her face against his coat. Basine was careful not to embrace her. Her yes had given him an inexplicable moment. He had felt himself expand under it. In her unexpected submission, he had never dreamed of such a thing ten minutes ago, she became suddenly someone who was very rare and sweet. He was still utterly oblivious of her, and had it turned out to be Marion in his arms instead of Henrietta, the difference would have made no change in him. The thing that was rare and sweet was the exhilaration in his senses, a purely spiritual exhilaration. He enjoyed it as one might enjoy some unforeseen and startling gift. He grew tender. He wanted to kiss the eyes and hair of her who had given this gift to him, the thing which felt so warm in his heart and tingled so pleasantly in his thought. He must reward her somehow for having stirred in him this delicious excitement, reward her for the sweet surfeit her surrender had given his vanity. For a moment, bewildered by this inner desire to express the gratitude he felt, he stood trembling. "'Oh, I love you so, my darling,' he whispered. "'You're so beautiful.' It was her reward for having surrendered to his unspoken demand. It was an expression of the overwhelming generosity that choked him. He found in the saying of the words a sweetness almost as keen as her surrender had afforded him. To hear himself say to someone, I love you, 
was mysteriously exhilarating. The thrill that accompanied his bestowal of largesse excited him to further experiment. He was not carried away, but he relished the emotions between them, the sense of having triumphed, and the provoking sense of bestowing grandiose reward. "'Darling, tell me, please tell me, will you marry me?' "'Oh, George!' "'Tell me, tell me!' He was acting now, making his voice dramatic, pretending uncontrollable longings. She must say yes. He wanted her to, and she must. He did not want to marry her. The thought had never occurred to him. But it would be unbearable now unless she said yes. He must pretend and act and make the thing end by her saying yes. Oh, I can't tell you, George, dear. You must, please. He had decided now finally to make her. A contest of wills. If he wanted a yes, there must be a yes. Because he wanted it. His arms crushed her. He fastened against her. He felt her resisting. There was still no desire in him. His arms were still dead. But he could brook no resistance. The fact of resistance was unimportant, but the idea of being resisted fired him with a passion entirely cerebral. He would warm her into saying yes, stir her senses, make her yield and her head swim until she said yes. I love you. Please say it. Say yes. Yes to what? Henrietta, for an instant, awoke from the confusions of the past few minutes. Her morality, training, code of life and all sat up like a wary censor and surveyed the scene. The censor nodded an affirmation. It was all right. Go ahead. With this affirmation her body took fire. The weakness she had been struggling against became a beautiful enervation a lassitude that swept her unresistingly forward. She had never done this before. She struggled for a moment to recall the censor, the thing that had always directed her. But she seemed to have been deserted. She was alone with sensations. Her virginal mind was unable to identify the excitement rising in her. She waited while his caresses grew bolder. Then, in a panic, born of a dim realization, she flung her arms passionately around Basine and sobbed. "'Yes, yes, oh, George, I will!' She felt at once that she had said it just in time, that it would have been sinful to continue another moment without promising she would marry him. Basine released her slowly. The incident abruptly was over. He had in fact lost interest in it immediately before she had spoken. The thrill had come, developed, and gone, a spiritual exultation which he had enjoyed to the utmost. But now it was over. His vanity, surfeited, had withdrawn from the situation. He was surprised to find himself looking at the girl with utter dispassion, as if nothing had happened. Inwardly he was amused. Such things were amusing, in a way. Moments in which one saw oneself as an outrageous actor, doing something ridiculous. It was like that now. Absurd. But it had been pleasant. Curious, how pleasant. However, that was over. Henrietta would, of course, forget about it. And he, he was prepared to return to the library and go on popping corn as if nothing had happened, absolutely nothing. But Henrietta leaned weakly against his arm. Oh, George, darling, do you really love me? He answered out of a social respect for consistency and nothing else. He thought the question rather tactless. Of course he didn't love her and she should have known better than to ask it. 
It had just been a game they had played while looking for the thingamabob. Yes, Henny, of course. Her eyes were wide and her lips quivered. She was looking at him as if he were doing something remarkable and she overcome with astonishment. For an instant, Basine wondered why the deuce she looked that way. Then he felt an unexpected chill that he dismissed promptly with an inwardly assuring smile as he heard her saying, Oh, we'll be so happy together when we're married. Isn't it wonderful, just too wonderful for words to be married, together? Oh, George, I'm so happy. I love you so much. And father will be so... End of chapter 5 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter Six of Gargoyles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Gargoyles by Ben Hecht. Chapter Six. They had not expected Mr. Gilchrist to come. Mr. Gilchrist was an undersized, mild little man with graying sideburns. When he was alone, he read a great deal. He had made money in the selling of expensive furniture. He was part owner of a store in Wabash Avenue. It was generally understood that people with taste patronized the Gilchrist Warren establishment. He arrived at the Basines with his wife and his son Aubrey. Keegan and Fanny had returned from a long walk. They and the judge, Henrietta, Basine and his mother and sister, Doris, all expressed surprise at seeing Mr. Gilchrist. There was always about Mr. Gilchrist the air of a museum piece, a quaint museum piece such as a keen but sentimental collector might delight in. The exclamations of surprise embarrassed the little man, and he stood fingering his sideburns and trying to smile in just the correct way. Mr. Gilchrist's arrival anywhere always precipitated this air of surprise. People said, "'Why, Mr. Gilchrist, awfully glad to see you. Haven't seen you for an age. Well, how are you?' This was as if they were extremely surprised. But they weren't. They were merely annoyed, upset, vaguely hostile, and condescending and these emotions inspired by the innocent Mr. Gilchrist could best be concealed by the feigning of a correct social astonishment. To the queries shot at him, Mr. Gilchrist answered, "'Very well, thank you. Thank you. Very well, thank you.' After greeting him with these exclamation points, people immediately forgot he was present. Mr. Gilchrist would sit the rest of the evening ignored by everybody, and trying to the end to smile in just the correct way. Inside Mr. Gilchrist were many little lonelinesses. His head was full of things he had read, of plots, of great characters, even of epigrams and biting iconoclasms. When people talked, he did his best to be attentive, and if they talked about things that interested him, the kings of France, the Italian wars of the fifteenth century, the topography of early London and kindred subjects, his face would tremble with enthusiasms. He would listen, his eyes questing eagerly for epigrams, for illuminating sentences he might contribute. But his unegoistic love for the subject would make him inarticulate. His eyes that had seemed about to speak of themselves that had seemed laden with excited informations, would close and a chuckle would come from his lips. The Caesars, the Borgias, the Medicis, the Bourbons, the Valois, Savonarola, Richelieu, the various Charles, Phillips, Williams, Henrys, the plumed headliners of history around whom had centered the hurdy-gurdy intrigues, the circus romances and wars of vanished centuries, these were the hail fellows of his imagination. But people seldom talked of these names. People were more interested in contemporary topics. 
He did his best to be attentive, but his thought played truant, and before he knew it, he would be going over secretly certain things in his head. Villon, Marlowe, Balzac, Dumas, Gautier, Suetonius. There was a rabble of them continually arguing and declaiming in Mr. Gilchrist's head. He liked to half-close his eyes and imagine what the great names used to have for breakfast, what the great names would say if he were to enter their presence or if they were to come into this room. He liked to bring up in his mind pictures of old Paris, London, Florence, Avignon, Vienna with their lopsided roofs, winding alleys, night watchmen, and king's guards. He could sit a whole evening this way thinking, then he came to an old inn, and there were lights inside, people drinking inside, telling stories and laughing. The innkeeper was a man named Simon. The curious stranger looked about him with an imperious eye. These words murmuring in his head would conjure up the picture, and there would be no further need for words. He was content to sit in the old inn, noticing its quaint decorations its quaint but romantic inmates. Adventures would follow, strange episodes, denouements, climaxes, all without words, as if he were watching a cinematograph. His attempted smile would remain, a smile that concealed the fact that he was neither smiling at those around him nor aware of what they were saying. For he would only half hear the chatter of the room and now and then nod his head vaguely at some question that people were answering, as if he too were answering it. He was almost sixty, and lonely because he knew of no one to whom he could talk. His wife in particular was a person to whom he never dreamed of talking. He had only a dim idea of what he wanted to say to someone. But all his life he had been hoping to meet this one who would be like himself. This someone would be a friend whom he could take with him into places like the old inn and the crazily twisting streets of old London or Paris. His days and years passed, however, without bringing him this companion, and outwardly he remained a mild little figure with sideburns, kindly tolerant toward everyone. When his dreams left him long enough to enable him to notice closely those about him, a feeling of sadness would come. He would feel sorry for the men and women he saw gesturing and heard talking and laughing. He thought they must be like himself, looking for something. His faded eyes would peer caressingly from behind his glasses, and he would make simple little remarks in an apologetic voice. He would ask what they had been doing, and when they answered in their careless, matter-of-fact ways, he would nod hopefully and appear pleased. To see Mr. Gilchrist in the midst of his family was to be convinced of the plausibility of immaculate conception. It was difficult imagining Mr. Gilchrist ever having done anything which might have resulted in fatherhood. But more than that, it was impossible even suggesting to oneself that his wife had ever received the embraces of a man, had ever so far forgotten the proprieties as to permit herself to be trapped alone with a man. Thus the presence of Aubrey, their son, became incongruous. And Aubrey himself helped this illusion. He was a young man who looked incongruous. He seemed like a hoax, or at least a caricature. He had enormous feet and ungainly legs, large hands and pipe-stem arms, hips like a woman, and a face capriciously mottled out of soft putty. His ugliness by itself would have been whimsical. His protruding eyes, long-pointed nose, uneven cheeks, and bulbous chin hinted at something waggish. But Aubrey had triumphed over his physical self. He had, with the air of a pair of large glasses from which dangled a black silk cord, and by holding his head thrown back as if there were a crick in his neck, acquired an air of dignity. It was his habit to glower with dignity, to stare with dignity, and to preserve a dignified inanimation when he was silent. 
He was pigeon-breasted, and this helped. In fact, his many slight deformities seemed all to contribute somewhat toward making him a man of inspiring dignity. People had little use for Mr. Gilchrist, his father. He was, of course, wealthy, but not wealthy enough to earn the regard of the poor. They discussed him, saying, "'He's not so simple as he pretends he is. Any man who's made a pile like old Gilchrist in the furniture business has a pretty smart head. And they added that they wouldn't be surprised if something eventually were found out about old man Gilchrist. He had a past. Of this people were convinced. It was his wife's position and the fear of her personality that protected Mr. Gilchrist from the downright attacks of rumor. Any man who pretended to be as kindly as Mr. Gilchrist and who talked so tolerantly about everybody and everything, was, you could bank on it, a sly rogue, afraid to say what he thought, because he himself was guilty of worse sins than those under discussion. Mr. Gilchrist, by seeming above the social agitation surrounding him, came to appear as one who looked down tolerantly upon inferiors, and this annoyed people. Who was Mr. Gilchrist, and what had he done that he should be giving himself airs? Of course, there was Aubrey, and... Aubrey was aloof and dignified, but that was to be expected of a man who worked with his brain all the time, inventing plots and characters, his friends explained. In fact, Aubrey's silences thrilled them even more than his talk. They felt, when he sat silent, that they were witnessing the birth in his head of some great idea which they would later read in a book. Aubrey was a man of superior qualities, and to bask in the presence of a superior was to partake of his superiority. Aubrey's superiority consisted, so far as Aubrey was concerned, of wearing the proper kind of eyeglasses, keeping his neck stiff, refraining from giving utterance to all the asininities which crowded his tongue, and writing romances containing heroes with whom a half-million women readers had imaginary affairs every night, and heroines whom another half-million men ravished in their dreams. For Aubrey was a celebrated popular fiction writer. To conceal the horrible reasons which made for the celebrity of Aubrey's fiction, the army of literary morons who succumbed to its influence grew louder and louder in their protestations that Aubrey was a great moral writer. They pointed out that here was a man whose heroines were pure, whose heroes were noble and virtuous, neglecting to add that these were the only kind of phantoms which could penetrate the guard of their own puritanism and stir the erotic impulses beneath. Aubrey's superiority was, for the most part, a state of mind that existed among the people who knew him, or had heard of him, or read of him. And this attitude toward him became part of Aubrey. He adopted it as the major side of his character, and lived chiefly in the opinions of others. His introspection consisted of reading press notices about himself, and thinking of what other people thought of him. Thus, to understand Aubrey, it was necessary to go outside him and to investigate this external state of mind, the ready-made robes of purple in which his little thoughts strutted through the day. The people in whose acclaim Aubrey robed himself were varied and many, but they inhabited an identical psychological stratum. They believed firmly that all artists and writers were poor, starving, unhappy creatures. This belief was borne out in their minds by history, such history as they permitted themselves to know. History was continually telling of geniuses who died in garrets, of great minds that could not make enough money to feed or clothe their bodies. In fact, one of the shrewdest ways to tell whether a man was a genius that is, had been a genius, was to determine whether he had been neglected during his life and died of malnutrition and disappointment. 
the people who acclaimed aubrey found a compensation in this they liked to assure themselves that geniuses starved to death this compensated them for the fact that they themselves were not geniuses it made them feel that it was actually a vital misfortune to be gifted since being gifted meant to suffer the neglect of one's fellows and the pangs of hunger but the knowledge that genius was neglected and hungry in no way inspired them to remedy the situation by recognizing its presence and feeding it to the contrary they were determined to see that it remained neglected and hungry the idea of struggling long-haired poets dressed in rags pleased them the idea of long-haired painters living on crumbs in attics gave them peculiar satisfaction geniuses were people different from themselves they believed in different things and pretended to be excited by different emotions and lived different lives and the people who acclaimed aubrey were pleased to know that there was a penalty attached to being different from themselves and they were interested in seeing that this penalty was not removed by penalizing the different ones whom they sensed as superiors they increased the value of their own inferiorities yet they acclaimed aubrey and there was no malice in their acclaim this was a phenomenon that had once startled aubrey long ago when he had first started to write his family's friends had said poor boy he'll starve to death there's no money in being an author and you lead a terrible life but aubrey had gone ahead and remained an author he had written at the beginning rather biting if sophomoric things inspired by the malice he sensed toward his profession but the inspiration had not been sufficiently strong to handicap him when success had come and his name was emerging the people who knew him and who had talked maliciously about his trying to be an author were the first to acclaim him this thing had confused aubrey he had felt that the public was a curious institution and he had for a few months wondered about it people sneered at struggling writers and referred with withering humor to art as all bunk and indignantly denounced its immorality then when one put oneself over despite their sneers they turned around and congratulated one as if one had done something of which they heartily approved it was as if they tried to make up for their previous attitude and for a few months aubrey cherished a cynical image of the public it was a great bully that spat and snarled at genius refusing to recognize it and making it a laughing-stock whenever it could but as soon as genius came through this same bully of a public turned around and prostrated itself and worshipped blindly at its feet then aubrey had spent the few months wondering why this was so but he had become too busy to do much thinking his publishers were demanding more work so he let other matters drop his curiosity had carried him to the brink of an idea and he had somewhat impatiently turned his back on it he had felt that to think as he was thinking about people who were praising him and buying his books was to play the part of an ungrateful cad the idea that had come dangerously close to aubrey's consciousness was the curious notion that people resented acclaiming anybody like themselves the lucky ones who secured their hurrah became in their eyes no longer normal humans but super persons about whom they were prepared to believe all manner of mythical grandeurs the more remarkable and more superior people could make out their heroes to be the less humility they felt in worshiping them and since their heroes were creatures in whom they recognized a glorification of their own virtues the more self-flattering it was to increase this glorification they were able to worship themselves with abandon in the splendors they attributed to their social superiors thus when they started they went the limit 
heaping honors and honors upon a man until he became a glittering godlike person. The country, at the time of Aubrey's ascent, was full of such glittering godlike creatures, whose names were continually in people's mouths and in their newspapers. The instinct of inferiority demanding, as always, an outlet in the invention of gods, had found a tireless medium for this hocus-pocus in the press. Great reputations were continually springing up. The newspapers, like the half-cynical, half-superstitious priests of the totem era, busying themselves with creating towering effigies in clay and smearing them with vermilion paints. These gods whom the people busily erected and before whom they busily prostrated themselves were, as always, the awesome deities created in their own image. There had been a crisis in Aubrey's life when he was caught between a desire to be himself and the desire to be a great clay figure with mysterious totems splashed over it. To be himself he had only to write as he vaguely thought he wanted to write, and to be one of the great figures he had merely to write what he definitely knew would win him the respect of others. The decision, however, had been taken out of his hands. Aubrey's talent had not been of the sort that has, for its parents, a hatred of society and a derision of its surfaces. He had, indeed, fancied himself for a short time as desiring to adventure among the doubts and iconoclasms which distinguished the literature he had encountered during his college days. But the fancy had proved no more than an egoistic perversion of the true impulse in him. This, it soon developed, was a desire to impress himself upon people as their superior, not their antithesis. As a result, he fell to writing books which carefully avoided the revolt which the dubious spectacle of manners and morality had stirred in him. He concentrated upon crystallizing his daydreams. He turned out tales of deftly virtuous Cinderella's who provokingly withheld their kisses for three hundred pages, of debonair Galahads with hearts of gold who, utilizing the current platitudes as an armor and a weapon, emerged in grandiose triumphs with the stubborn virgins thawing deliriously around their necks. Aubrey's tales were popular at once. They were the technically arranged versions of the rigmarole of secret make-believes that went on in his own as well as other people's heads. People read them and quivered with delight. They were tales which, like their own daydreams, served as an antidote for the puny, unimpressive realities of their lives. Also, they were moral, high-minded tales, and thus they served as a vindication of the codes, fears, taboos, which contributed the puniness to the realities of their lives. Aubrey's success increased rapidly as he abandoned altogether the pretense of plumbing souls and gave himself wholeheartedly to the creative pleasantries of plumbing the soap bubble worlds in whose iridescence people found their compensations. At twenty-nine, Aubrey was becoming one of the glittering godlike personages in whose worship the public finds outlet for its inferiority mania and simultaneous concealment therefrom. He had realized this in time, and without conscious effort adjusted himself toward the perfections demanded of a personage worthy of receiving the masochistic and self-ennobling salute of the mob. These perfections were simply and easily achieved. One had only to acquiesce, to accept the acclaim of outsiders as a part of one's self, and to live one's inner life in a roseate contemplation of this acclaim. One had only to remember one's public, as he put it himself, and not to disappoint them or antagonize them. In his own family he was regarded with awe. His father always felt bewildered when he spoke to him. And even Mrs. Gilchrist revealed a slightly human nervousness in her contacts with her son. Concerning Mrs. Gilchrist, there was not much to be said, even by such incipient iconoclasts as Mrs. Bazine. 
she was too defined an exterior. One was conscious in her presence not so much of a woman as of an invincible battlefront of ideas. Nobody had ever heard Mrs. Gilchrist give expression to anything which could remotely be identified as an idea. Nevertheless, she was a battlefront. She was a woman with an intimidating coldness of manner. This manner spoke without words of an incorruptible intolerance toward all deviations from her code. Backsliders, moral culprits, unmannerly persons, and, in fact, everyone not actively under her domination, were, to Mrs. Gilchrist, suspect. She managed to give the impression that people whom she did not know were creatures whose virtues as well as social prestige were matters of sinister doubt. They were outside the pale. The secret of her domination was a psychological phenomenon that eluded her antagonists, and so left them powerless to combat it. The strength Mrs. Gilchrist felt within her was the product of a complete repression. She had managed, since her youth, to shut herself successfully within the narrow limits of her consciousness, successfully divorcing all her thoughts, desires, and actions from any dictates of an inner self. She had formed an ideal, basing it upon her social ambitions and her childish prejudices of good and bad, desirable and undesirable. And she had been able to perfect this ideal. Her mind was a tiny fortress against which her own emotions, and hence the emotions of others, battled in vain. It could neither think nor understand, and this was its strength. The doubts which thinking sometimes stirred in the minds of her antagonists, the knowledge of secret impulses and obscene imaginings which they were only able imperfectly to keep from themselves, and which made it possible for them to appreciate dimly the sinners and iconoclasts in the world, such knowledge never intruded upon Mrs. Gilchrist. Her indignation toward backsliders and moral culprits was not a projected censure of similar weakness in herself. There were no windows in the tiny fortress in which she lived. Protected from all human disturbances of her spirit, she spent her days closeted within her little fortress in grim contemplation of her rectitude. Friendship was impossible to her. She was, however, a duchy, a corporation in which one could buy stock. By subscribing unquestionably to her rectitude, admitting its existence publicly and succumbing to its strength, one earned the dividends of her social approval one became to her a very nice person in whose submission she grudgingly saw, as in an imperfect mirror, the image of her own virtues. Curiously enough, Mrs. Gilchrist was renowned for her activity as a philanthropist and a charity worker. Her social prestige, aside from her strength of character, was based upon this. She was a perennial patroness, a member of hospital boards, a chairman of bazaars, special matinees, charity balls, and money-raising campaigns. All these activities were in the interest of the poor. The money raised by them went toward bringing comfort to creatures whose moral obliquity and human weaknesses Mrs. Gilchrist authentically despised. Yet she was indefatigable in her work, darting in her unvarying black dress from meeting to meeting, bristling with magnificent plans for further philanthropies. Her husband occasionally wondered. He was unable to reconcile the coldness he knew in his wife with the character of her labors. At times he dimly felt that it was her way of saying something, perhaps a way of showing a hidden warmth toward people. But in Mrs. Gilchrist's thought there was no such explanation. To have admitted to herself a concern for the creatures in whose behalf she devoted her energies would have been to open a door in the tiny fortress, 
or at least to create a loophole out of which she might look with sympathy upon the confusions and torments of her fellows. Her inner humanism, divorced from the narrow limits of her consciousness, was finding its outlet, as her husband suspected, in her work. But during this work never for a moment did Mrs. Gilchrist think of the creatures she was benefiting. She had rationalized her activities and made them a part of the emotionless content of her mind. All relation between the things she did and the people she did them for was divorced in her thought. In bazaars she superintended, in balls, fates, campaigns, auctions she energized with her presence, she saw only bazaars, ball, fetes, campaigns, and auctions. She worked for their success with an invulnerable preoccupation in the details which went to make them socially proper and financially triumphant. The altruism of her work inspired no altruism in her. She did not allow herself to sympathize with the weakness and poverty she was aiding, or even to contemplate them for an instant. Yet her work accomplished, the charity a success, she experienced the stern elation of having done good. This elation was inspired in no way by the thought of the solace she had brought to others. It was entirely egoistic a moment in which her rectitude congratulated itself upon its rectitude. End of chapter 6 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 7 of Gargoyles This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Gargoyles by Ben Hecht. Chapter 7 Fanny Bazine smiled timidly at Aubrey. He was paying little attention to her. He was listening to Judge Smith airing his views on the annexation of the Philippines. The judge was forcibly declaring that the thing was essential and that no gentleman with his country's future at heart could possibly believe otherwise. Aubrey, to the judge's secret discomfiture, somehow managed to convey an assent to these views, but an assent based on superior motives. What these motives were, Judge Smith was unable to fathom. Aubrey, when it came his turn to expound, further irritated the judge by revealing them. He, Aubrey, was for the annexation of the Philippines, but only because he was convinced such an annexation would be of supreme benefit to the natives of the islands. Mrs. Gilchrist nodded sternly in agreement with her son. The rest of the company, listening with vacuous attentiveness, waited for the debaters to continue talking for them. Bazine, who had been silent, came to the judge's rescue. He explained that the judge and Aubrey meant practically the same thing, but that they had chosen different ways to express themselves. Judge Smith, Bazine smiled, sees in the annexation something which will benefit his country. He knows as well as any of us that it will not benefit it financially. It will be a source of expenditure and strife. Then how will it benefit us? because it will give us an opportunity to aid a pack of uncivilized and benighted heathen, and despite them to bring peace and prosperity to their own country, not ours, which is exactly what you mean, Aubrey. The judge beamed approval, and Aubrey contented himself with a stare of dignity. He did not relish psychological interpretations of his words. As an author, he felt annoyed. But Bazine continued to talk undeterred by his stare. He disliked Aubrey, not so much as Doris, and in a somewhat different way. Further, the presence of Henrietta was a curious inspiration. The girl's wide-eyed tenderness had irritated and frightened him after the incident in the kitchen when they had gone searching for the thingamabob. 
Now, he had no interest in the Philippine controversy. But he had entered the discussion in order to rid himself of the uncomfortable memory the episode with Henrietta had left him. As he talked, the memory played hide-and-seek in his words. She thinks I'm going to marry her. But she's engaged to him. She's crazy. What the hell did I do it for? Damn it! Damn it! Instinctively he took the judge's part, as if he must establish himself firmly in the father's good graces in order to make premature amends for the jilting of his daughter. The position he had taken pleased him because it also involved an opposition to Aubrey. Fanny continued to smile at the novelist. Keegan bored her. They had been walking together, and she had lost interest in the sensual game she had been playing with him. Alone, she might have tried to repeat the experience of the morning with Keegan, but her physical curiosity partially gratified for the moment by the surreptitious excitement she had derived from him, her interest transferred itself to Aubrey. The man amused and impressed her. Her thoughts separated him into two people. She resented his persistent dignity. Her perceptions, sharpened by the practical sensuality of her nature, saw through the little ruses by which Aubrey converted his slight deformities into a dignified whole. As she listened to him, she said to herself, He thinks it's smart to wear a ribbon on his glasses. He sticks his chest out. He's got skinny arms. He looks funny. After a half hour, she lost her resentment, and the thing that had inspired it came to amuse her. She could see through his funny manner, so it didn't anger her. But although now she smiled with amusement at the man's impressiveness, a feeling of awe penetrated her. Aubrey was a great man. People spoke his name everywhere. He was known. A delicious tremble passed through her. She was careful not to translate it into words. Had she inspected the tremble and its causes, it would have outraged her. She was content always to accept her emotions blindly, for fear of having to forego them if she knew their causes. She kept herself intact in her own mind as a good girl, not by belligerently repressing her impulses, but by enjoying them secretly outside her mind. She had thought of Aubrey as a great man, and with it had come the inner impulse to be embraced passionately by him. Not because he was Aubrey, but because he was the famous Aubrey Gilchrist, whose name was known. To be embraced by a famous man would be like being embraced somehow by all the people who knew his name. She would be able to think, while satisfying her desire, everybody knows him. They know all about him. It's almost as if they knew he was doing this, I was doing this. Then, too, there would be a feeling of intense secrecy about it, a sort of blasphemous secrecy. When an ordinary man kissed her, that was, of course, a secret. But if a famous man should kiss her, a man like Aubrey, that would be a super-secret, a violation of something remarkable. It would be a thing concealed not merely from her family and from the vague circle of friends who might be interested, but from millions of people who knew Aubrey and who would be tremendously interested in everything he did. She would be giving herself to a public figure, and yet the thing she was doing would be marvelously concealed from the public, and so she would be able to enjoy the thrill of demonstramania, of being taken by someone who was not an individual like Keegan, but a man who was part of other people's minds, and at the same time she would be able to enjoy the thrill of defiant intimacy, the knowledge that the people in whose minds the name Aubrey Gilchrist was alive, would be ignorant of what she was doing to the man they admired. All this would be a sharpening of pleasure by the consciousness of wholesale deceit, wholesale intimacy. 
these intuitions whose articulation would have been entirely unintelligible to fanny sent the delicious tremble through her body immediately the two separate aubreys of her mind focused into one and she lost both her amusement and her awe of him she sat regarding him with a timid smile designed to arouse his curiosity as yet he had ignored her his eyes seeking out henrietta when the annexation debate waned basine had diverted the talk into literary channels by inquiring apropos of nothing whether anyone had read a book by a man named meredith he had found it in doris's room one evening and glanced through it seeking now for further material with which to discomfit aubrey he had remembered the volume he took it for granted that since his sister doris had been reading it the book was a very worthwhile book the kind he cared nothing about reading himself this did not interfere with his utilizing an exposition of its merits as a weapon against aubrey i was quite surprised he explained doris listened with a frown she was certain her brother had not read the book and the knowledge he was lying aggravated her she knew he lied continually but was indifferent but to have him lie about something she admired even in its defense made her uncomfortable as if he were trying to establish false claims upon her regard the book is altogether unlike most books he went on generalizing carefully his mind, totally ignorant of the subject he was discussing, was shrewdly inventing a book diametrically opposite in style and content to the books Aubrey wrote. By praising such a book, he would manage without reference to his antagonist to disparage his entire literary output. He was not clear in his mind why Aubrey had become an antagonist the memory reiterating itself behind his words she thinks i'm going to marry her damn it was mysteriously finding outlet in an indignation neither against himself nor henrietta but against the unsuspecting aubrey fanny listened to the new conversation but meredith was soon dropped the sight of mrs gilchrist grimly poised opposite her mother became a part of the lure Aubrey exercised over her. He was the son of this hard-faced, domineering woman. To do something with him that was intimate would be a deliciously concealed violation of the mother's propriety. Fanny had always been intimidated by Mrs. Gilchrist's propriety. Embracing her son would be a sort of revenge. Without wasting time looking for reasons, Fanny felt Aubrey as an attraction. Her attitude toward him grew more intimate. She did not try to enter the talk, but adjusted herself in the chair, placing her body so that the curve of her hip and leg were effectively visible to Aubrey. And while the others talked, she assured herself of the plausibility of her ambitions. Aubrey was a great man, and very famous and distinguished but he was after all entirely human he had written books and fanny fell to thinking about them about the descriptions of love-making which crowded the pages of his books aubrey was famous and therefore aloof but the things that had made him famous the love passages in his books were not intimidating she remembered them with gratitude they were love descriptions, and Aubrey had written them. Love passages were, in fact, all that Fanny usually remembered of her reading. Plots and characters escaped her. After she had closed a book, there remained in her mind merely the scenes in which men had placed their arms around women and whispered, after a succession of exciting adjectives, I love you. This was due to the manner in which Fanny read. As a girl, she had plowed laboriously through a set of Shakespeare in quest of obscene passages. 
her girl's eyes would skip with irritation the speeches that seemed to her extraneous until caught by some nasty word she would become eagerly interested and carefully digest the sentences preceding and following it at fourteen she had discovered that the dictionary stuck away in a dusty corner of the bookcase was filled with many such words whenever occasion permitted she opened the big volume and pored intently over its contents digesting with excitement the definitions of what she called to herself the nasty words the result of this curious reading technique had gradually shown itself as she matured literature became to her a secretly immoral and indecent thing she would blush when people mentioned shakespeare or any of the books in which she had eagerly browsed observing that her blushes gave people an impression of her sensitive chastity she developed a habit of seeming offended at the mention of any volume she suspected of containing such words and passages as she was continually searching for in secret she would say oh i don't like that kind of a book i don't think people should write like that about such things there are so many nice things to write about i don't see why people must write about the others delivering herself on these sentiments on all occasions she continued her furtive hunt for books about such things one red-letter evening she stumbled upon a pamphlet in her brother's room describing the horrors of venereal diseases and outlining with verbal and pictorial illustrations the ravages wrought by the disease germs she had devoured the information greedily her sensuality editing the well-intentioned brochure into a mass of erotic revelations aubrey's books although a bit too innocuous to exhilarate her as the pamphlet had done or even the dictionary properly read was able to do contained innumerable passages she remembered she treated his writing as she did all writing skimming hastily over irrelevant matters such as dialogues between men discussions of abstract problems mother and child scenes and coming to a pause only at the portions which began with some such sentence as he looked at her with burning eyes or she felt nervous because at last she was alone with him or he tried to draw her to him but she resisted her virtue outraged by the light in his eyes she recalled these passages now as the literary discussion grew warmer the knowledge that aubrey had written them served to humanize him and remove his aloofness in her eyes he was a famous man on the other hand he was famous because he wrote such things as she yielded with a happy sigh to the manly embrace aubrey felt irritated with basine he stood up and seemingly without intention walked to a vacant chair next to fanny the conversation had been taken up by mrs gilchrist who was explaining the real purpose of her visit we are giving a fete on mrs channing's lawn she was saying and i would very much like you to be one of the members of the committee on printing mrs basine felt an elation at the words she had read about the channing lawn fete an affair of social magnificence designed to raise funds for the associated charities great social names were involved mrs basine's heart trembled gratefully oh thank you she said her voice taking on a formal artificial tone mrs gilchrist nodded the tone pleased her she could count on the basine woman among the select who showed their gratitude openly at the largesse of her favor she would in fact deign to stay for supper as a reward mrs basine urging her to remain for the light sunday evening meal felt indignant with herself she would have preferred to refuse the committee on printing even as she accepted and experienced the elation her thought bristled with revolt the old fool the old fool repeated itself with annoying clarity in her mind 
she detested Mrs. Gilchrist. Since her husband's death, Mrs. Basine had outgrown the snobbery which had inspired her during her life to pour over the society columns. But a habit had been established, the habit of a desire to become a member of the closely knit organization known as society. And now she was apparently powerless to overcome this desire, which no longer animated her, but yet intruded out of the past. She looked down upon herself for the elation over becoming a member of a printing committee for a social charity fete. "'I hate it. I just hate it,' she would murmur for days at a time. But the elation would persist, a thing beyond the control of her improved outlook upon life. She was aware also of the simple process by which she transferred her self-indictment into a detestation of Mrs. Gilchrist. Mrs. Gilchrist was the one who appealed to what Mrs. Basine had grown to regard as her smaller nature, and her anger toward the imperturbable dowager was the anger of a virtuous woman toward one whose temptations she was unable to resist. "'You've been rather silent,' Aubrey smiled patronizingly at Fanny. She nodded. "'Oh, I've been so interested in what you've been saying.' she answered. She noticed with a feeling of sisterly gratitude that Basine had occupied himself with Henrietta. Aubrey caught the direction of her glance and frowned. He had developed a definite dislike of Basine during the afternoon. Keegan, listening uncomfortably to the judge who was ignoring him in his talk, but whose audience Keegan felt it a social necessity to remain, tried vainly to capture Fanny's eyes. She had apparently forgotten his existence. But now, as Aubrey seated himself at her side, she smiled intimately in the direction of the confused Keegan. "'Oh, Hugh!' she said loud enough for him to hear. The sound of his name from the girl gave Keegan an inexplicable sensation. He felt himself break into happy smiles and the anxiety that had been growing in his heart seemed abruptly to have vanished under her voice. He came to her side and stood looking timidly at her. The conviction came over Fanny that Keegan was in love. She felt pleased and her heart warmed toward him, but her interests remained exclusively preoccupied with the novelist. I was just going out to the kitchen and wondered if you wanted to help cut sandwiches. She smiled at Keegan. Sure, he answered. I'm an excellent cook myself, Aubrey unbent gravely. Fanny stood up and started toward the hall. The two men hesitated and then followed her. Basine, frowning slightly toward the door, listened to her voice chattering to cover the embarrassed silence of the two men she had bagged. "'Don't you want to go out there and help?' he turned to Henrietta. She shook her head. Keegan felt himself being slowly transported. His penitence had faded into less satisfactory emotions toward the middle of the day. A gloom had come over him, and his heart had felt weighted. He had at first identified this state of mind as a ghastly premonition of disease as a result of last night's debauch, and thought that the depression he felt was his nervous system, or something warning him of this fact. The depression lifted. He sat around the Basine home listening to the chatter of the arriving guests and feeling out of place. He felt that he was wishing for something but couldn't make out what it was. His heart hurt, his head felt heavy. There were aches in him and a feeling of listlessness. More, he couldn't sit still. The room seemed a suffocating place. He was unhappy. Several hours later it dawned on him with a shock that he was in love with Fanny. The sudden explanation frightened him. He attempted to deny it to himself. The struggle endured a half hour. He surrendered. 
When he looked at Fanny again, she had undergone a complete change. There was a startling intimacy in her features. Her contours were stamped with an appeal he had never observed before in a woman. The rest of the company sat behind a thin film of politeness and formality, but Fanny sat with him outside this film. The others in the room were blurred as if half-hidden. Fanny was distinct. A light seemed to beat upon her. He looked in amazement. A few hours ago he had noticed nothing. Now he noticed everything. Her dress, her hands, her hair, her eyes, her ankles. He was frightened because it seemed as if someone had invaded the secret world in which he alone lived. He remembered frightenedly that he had lain with his head in her lap, that he had embraced her. There had been something curious about the embrace, but he was unable to identify it. She felt sorry for me, that's all, he thought, and at once all hope ebbed out of him. Yet he continued to look at her and watch her grow more familiar, so familiar that her image seemed to have come into his heart, where he could feel it choking him. A few minutes after entering the kitchen, he grew hopeful. He found himself in the position of an intimate, at least by comparison. She was paying no attention to Aubrey. She laughed at his, Keegan's, clumsiness, chided him good-naturedly. She held his hand, and, his heart beating wildly, directed him in slicing the bread. When he was drawing the water from the sink faucet, she leaned over, resting her chin on his shoulder, and effected a humorous concern. He felt her body press warmly against him and almost drop the cut glass pitcher he was holding. He was being transported. Out of the corner of his eye he watched the novelist, a sorry fellow with gawky feet and a clumsy-looking face. Keegan vaguely pitied him as he stood around doing his best to horn in on the intimacy between Fanny and himself. He knew how the novelist felt. It seemed to Keegan even that it was he, Keegan, feeling that way, and that the carefully concealed embarrassment, the futile chagrin and lameness, were his own emotions, and not Aubrey Gilchrist's. In an effort to put the defeated rival at his ease, so Keegan regarded him, he tried magnanimously to include him in the little by-play between himself and Fanny. "'Here, you try your hand at this,' he offered, handing Aubrey the knife. Fanny pouted. "'Huh. Just as I was teaching you the art of bread-cutting, you run away from school,' she complained. Keegan resumed his operations on the bread, a satisfied warmth in his heart. For her hand had returned to its position, and she was again going through the idiotic pretense of teaching him how to move a knife. He was being transported. His vacuous face had taken on a vivacity. He was fearful of presuming, of doing something wrong, and he made no effort to caress her. No effort was necessary, for, somehow, despite his carefully edited behavior, their fingers were always touching, their bodies coming together. Still, he was afraid to think that Fanny had fallen in love with him. He was even afraid that Aubrey would go away and leave them alone in the kitchen. If they were alone, he would have to try to kiss her, or something, and she would laugh, and then say indignantly, you idiot, I was just playing. I see now that you think all women are like those you told me about. He would rather that Aubrey remained and that everything continued as it was. The sandwiches were piling up on the large platters. Here, Fanny cried, holding one of them up for him to bite. He looked apologetically at Aubrey, as if asking to be forgiven for this proof of her superior regard and with a blush ate from her fingers. Fanny suddenly let go the sandwich, 
and as it dropped to the floor, patted him tenderly on his cheek and laughed. "'Um, big man hungry,' she whispered. He turned to place the fallen pieces of bread in the sink. His hand brushed hers, and he felt her fingers close firmly around his palm with a squeeze. He half shut his eyes at the shock that filled his heart. Fanny's eyes, however, ignored him. She was engaged in watching Aubrey, for whose benefit the entire scene was being staged. Her instinct had supplied her with a mode of attack. She would arouse desire in the novelist by showing herself desired, although by another man. A desired woman was an irritant. It aroused illogical jealousy. The icebox was in the back hallway. "'The cream and things are in here!' Fanny exclaimed. Keegan followed her out of the kitchen into the rear vestibule. She had squeezed his hand before starting and thrown him a glance as she passed through the doorway. He felt embarrassed for Aubrey and was on the point of inviting him to share the intimacy of the small vestibule. But Fanny interrupted him. "'Oh, Hugh,' she called softly, "'will you chop some ice, please, for the water?' She handed him the ice pick and laughed nervously. The door was half open, and Keegan caught a glimpse of the novelist, pretending a vast interest in the arrangement of the sandwiches on the plates. "'What's the matter, Hugh? You seem so... so funny,' Fanny whispered close to him. His heart contracted. He was afraid. If he dared, he would put his arms around her. But after all the things he had confessed to her in their walk, a longing to weep almost brought tears out of his eyes. He stood with his mouth open and stared, as in a dream, at a blurred vision. "'Fanny,' he muttered, "'I'm sorry.' "'About last night?' she whispered. He nodded. "'But, Hughie, you said you wouldn't ever again.' He felt despair. "'If I only hadn't, I would—' He stopped. "'Would what, Hughie?' Fear halted him definitely. He could go no further. A misery clouded his thought. He felt her hand touching his arm. "'You mustn't feel sorry, Hugh. Please promise me you won't feel sorry.' The sweetness of her voice overpowered him, and his eyes grew wet. He tried to talk, but was ashamed of the quiver he felt in his throat. Fanny pressed lightly against him. He stood with his head reeling and his heart dancing crazily as her arm circled his neck. Her face was raised to his. "'Just one, Hughie. Please don't forget.' Please hurry. He heard her words, but they conveyed no meaning. He loved her. He loved her. He had never been happy like this. He couldn't tell her now. The icebox, something, was in the way. But sometime he would tell her. His arms and body felt alive. Oh, he thought, Fanny, Fanny. Then he heard himself repeating the thought aloud. He was saying in a voice he hardly recognized, "'Oh, Fanny, Fanny!' He kissed her lips. For a moment Fanny returned his kiss passionately. Her arms clutched him tightly. She felt a curious lift in her heart, a thing she had never experienced before. It made her almost close her eyes but she kept them open, watching furtively over Keegan's shoulder the figure of Aubrey. Aubrey had remained bent over the plates of sandwiches. Despite the lift in her heart, this annoyed her. She wanted Aubrey's attention. "'Oh!' she sighed aloud. Aubrey heard. 
he straightened and for a moment stared at the tableau of the lovers. Fanny, watching him behind Keegan's kiss, saw his face grow red. Then she lowered her eyes and abandoned herself to the sensation of Keegan's arms. But the sensations faded. An interest seems to have gone out of the situation. She pushed Keegan gently away and looked into the kitchen. Aubrey was gone. Oh, she whispered. Keegan looked at her dizzily. He saw. Who? Aubrey Gilchrist saw you. Her face flushed. Did he? Keegan leaned against the icebox. He felt weak. I'm sure he did, Fanny insisted, an elated note in her voice. I'm just positive. He couldn't have seen much if he did, from where he was standing, Keegan murmured. I don't care anyway, Fanny smiled. Keegan felt a thrill at the words. She loved him and didn't care who knew. Neither do I, he agreed. He felt glad they had been seen. It made him blush inside, but he was glad. Oh, what do we care, Fanny cried, if the old stick in the mud did see. Keegan reached his hands to her, but she eluded him and darted into the kitchen. Hurry, chop the ice, she called. She was confused. For a moment she had been surprised by an emotion, a curious, unsensual desire for the awkward Keegan. She had felt her heart yield to his embrace, as she usually felt her body do. But the whole thing had been for Aubrey's benefit. It had started with an intention of making Aubrey jealous by flirting with Keegan. And when Aubrey had refused to show any signs of jealousy, she had carried the flirtation further until it had seemed logical to kiss and embrace Keegan as a part of her original ambition to stir Aubrey. But she had been stirred herself by the man's kiss. Yet now that Aubrey was gone, she had lost all interest in Hugh. She wanted to hurry back where the novelist was. She glanced apprehensively toward the door. Doris was standing looking at her. "'What's the matter, Dory?' "'Mr. Ramsey has come. Mother said to set another place.' "'Good heavens! What a houseful!' Doris nodded. Keegan was standing in the center of the room, smiling inanely at the sink. "'I'll help you,' said Doris. End of Chapter 7 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 8 of Gargoyles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Gargoyles by Ben Hecht. Chapter 8. Mrs. Bazine was embarrassed by the arrival of her friend, Tom Ramsey. He had been a friend of her husband, and a rumor had become current that he was now courting her. She denied this with indignation. To herself she admitted she liked to be alone with him. He was a sour-minded man with a liver-red face, a patrician nose, and the look of a man of importance. But he was too thin and too short to live up to this look. In the presence of others he usually felt into a silence, unless one of the two or three subjects in which he felt himself an authority came up. These subjects were things that had to do with advertising, effective copy, effective display, prices, results. Mr. Ramsey was in the advertising business. Mrs. Bazine's embarrassment at his arrival was caused by her sympathy for the man and her resentment of his weakness. She knew exactly what would happen. 
Tom Ramsey would sit through the evening, scrupulously polite to everyone, saying, Yes, yes, quite right. Oh, of course. That's absolutely right. Indeed, I agree with you. For the first few minutes he would impress everyone as a man of character and intelligence, but gradually this impression would fade and people would stop talking to him and eventually ignore him altogether in the conversation. Why this happened Mrs. Bazine could never determine, but it did and it always hurt her. Mr. Ramsey, smiling exuberantly through the introduction, his thin body alive in the slightly overheated room, would in an hour become Mr. Ramsey sitting glassy-eyed and polite in a corner, his liver-red face holding with difficulty a grimace of enthusiastic attentiveness. He would make sporadic starts trying to recover something. When the talk grew boisterous and everyone was making puns and delivering himself of bouncing sarcasms, Ramsey would try to become part of the scene in a way that always startled the company. He would come to life with mysterious suddenness and hurl a jest into the common pot. His manner, however, focused attention on himself rather than his words. In back of the drollery he offered would be a desperation, in fact sometimes a sense of fury. People would stare at him for an instant, thinking, what an odd, impossible man, and in their contemplation forget to laugh at his remark, forget even to answer it, and he would be left stranded in a silence, a conversational castaway. A moment later he would collapse, sit glowering in his chair, looking angrily at the carpet. This was painful to Mrs. Bazine since she had grown to understand him. When they were alone, Ramsey became a different man. He talked to her usually about people he had met in her house. At such times he was master of caricature. Their absurdities, pompousness, banalities, hypocrisies took grotesque outline in his words. His method was unvarying. It was based upon a crude, vicious skepticism, inspired in turn by a fanatic resentment of success in others. He seemed determined always to prove to his own and her satisfaction that despite their pretensions, people were no more successful than he. His nature seemed unable to tolerate the thought of superiors. At the same time, people he encountered particularly in the Bazine home, managed always to override him, to reduce him to silence, to deflate him. He would retire into himself, protesting viciously at the injustice of this phenomenon, and while he sat in silence he would seek to wipe out the consciousness of his own inferiority by attacking with contempt the people around him. He would sit belittling and ridiculing the company to himself until he had hypnotized himself with a conviction of their general worthlessness and inferiority. Bolstered up by this treacherous conviction, he would come suddenly to life with a grotesque sense of magnitude in his mind. He was a giant among pygmies, a Socrates among clowns. Who were these numbskulls and four-flushers? that they thought they were better than he was. He would show them. He would step forth and by a single gesture, a scintillant phrase, reduce them to their proper place. And the company would find itself staring for an instant at a thin little man with a wild look in his eyes and a snarling quiver in his voice, saying something not quite intelligible, usually an involved pun or a tardy comment on some issue under discussion. The intensity of the sullen-faced little man with the patrician nose embarrassed them for the moment. Not as much as it did Mrs. Bazine, whose heart would almost break at the spectacle, but enough to make them feel it were best to ignore this curious Mr. Ramsey and not let on what a fool he somehow made of himself. Ramsey's indignation toward people, 
his sour skepticism of their values, was his futile way of reassuring himself of his own worth. Futile because he had no conviction of this worth. When he sat denouncing in silence the talkers around him, ridiculing and belittling them, it was merely a less painful outlet for the contempt he had of himself. He had been since his youth ridden by this inner feeling that he was a fool, a weakling, not quite a man. It had started in his boyhood when the nickname Sissy had been attached to him. His high-pitched voice, his thin body, and his unboyish modesty had earned him the name. As he grew older, the fact that he did not care for girls as other youths did, and that he sometimes played with them as if he were a girl himself, had not escaped the keen, cruel eyes of his companions. The name Sis Ramsey had stuck. In order to convince these companions of his masculinity, he had thrown himself with violence into their roughest games. In high school, he had sought to establish himself as a hardened sinner, a drinker and a tough citizen. Despite his slight body, he had developed into a creditable athlete. More than that, he had become known as a fellow who would fight at the drop of a hat. His fiery temper became a byword. But all these masculine, or seemingly masculine, attributes were part of his effort to prove that despite his somewhat odd voice and his equally odd indifference toward girls, he was a man. When he left high school and started in the offices of the McKay Advertising Company, the name Sissy had dropped from him. He had no longer to contend with the keen, cruel eyes of boy companions. Men were content to accept him at whatever value he chose to place on himself as far as his character was concerned. The struggle, instead of abating, however, only increased. It removed itself from the external combat of his boyhood to an internal complication, and became the basis of the feeling of inferiority which shaped his life. This inner knowledge he cherished, that he was inferior to people, was founded on the conviction that he was impotent, or at least nearly impotent, that he could never marry and have children like other men. His mind refused to acknowledge this fact, and thus, instead of finding the comparatively harmless exit of regret, it permeated his entire thought with the word inferior. Inferior. Ramsey kept himself desperately blind to the cause of this permeation. He concentrated on the detached word inferior and belabored it with untiring fury. There was another secret, one that went deeper than the hidden conviction of impotency. In the indignation which continually filled his mind, the hideous secret that lived almost within grasp of his understanding was conveniently clouded. It was the secret that his lack of vigor a fact in itself that he sometimes contemplated, was caused by a still deeper thing, a thing that never reached any clearer articulation than a shudder. They had called him Sissy as a boy, and he had not changed with age. He had been able to repress the impulses that sought to turn him toward men instead of women for companionship. He had repressed them by the ruse of convincing himself he was an ascetic. It was, moreover, an attitude which could find outlet. He could devote himself to the continual denunciation of others, developing into a sour, cynical, choleric man of fifty, a vindictive, unpleasing personality. Mrs. Bazine herded her guests into the dining room. Ramsey's presence preoccupied her. She found herself watching him as a mother might look after a sickly child. The intimacy that had grown between her and her dead husband's friend had been too gradual to trace. It had started when Mrs. Bazine had sat one evening in the midst of a company similar to this and thought, Poor man! 
he jumps around like that and acts queerly because he's ashamed of himself. He's ashamed of not being what he wants to be. She did not quite understand what this meant, but she felt herself suddenly close to the man, after having thought it. He began to seek her company alone, and more and more to use her as an audience for his ruse of transferring his self-rage into a critical indignation of others. A realization of Ramsey's character had stirred a pity in her, and out of this pity she was careful not to let him see it. She went to the extreme of pretending a blindness toward his shortcomings and of accepting him for the thing he tried to make himself out to be, a giant among pygmies. She would agree with him in his attacks upon others, second his vicious caricaturing, and appear always impressed by his desperate skepticism. Ramsey, as a result, had come to regard her as the one person with whom he had ever felt at ease during his life. Mrs. Bazine was a woman who understood him, that is, one who was completely deceived by him. In her presence, the creature he struggled unsuccessfully to become, the masquerade of magnificence which his inferiority sought futilely to assume, in her presence these became realities. He would swagger before her, deride her, browbeat her, and the rage which bubbled everlastingly in him would have respite. His mind seemed to uncloud, and his talk would grow actually clever, some of his caricatures bringing an authentic laugh from her. But the widow, as a rule, would sit listening to him, watching his swagger, her heart lacerated by the poignant things it sensed. It was as if he were a little boy dressed up in an Indian suit and emitting war whoops, and she must sit by and pretend real horror of his juvenile make-believe, as if he were someone who would drop dead with anguish in the midst of his laughter, if she were to say aloud what was in her mind. Oh, you poor man, I'm sorry for you. I am so ashamed for you. She did not understand why, despite these things, she felt a thrill of pleasure when she found herself alone with him. Her pity for the man seemed a pleasant excitement. It gave her a sense of intimacy toward him. She admitted this to herself, but wondered about it. There had been one evening that remained confusedly in her mind. He had seemed unusually buoyant, she recalled, after it was over. His cleverness had actually diverted her. His caricatures of Judge Smith and Mrs. Gilchrist, and even her own son. She had felt a certain truth in the distorted descriptions he gave of her friends. Then, without warning, he had grown violently excited. She had watched him with a fear in her heart, a warning to her that he was going to say something. She remembered him walking up and down the room, saying, the trouble with you, like with most people, my dear lady, is that you don't understand things. You look at things through a fog. You don't see through the pretenses of people. Your brain isn't active. It's merely receptive. It doesn't question. And what's the result? His voice had become high-pitched. You live your lives among lies. That's what you do. Lies, lies, you thrive on lies. Your friends are lies, your thoughts, everything. Take me, now take me, my case. I'll tell you something you don't understand. Just by the way of proof, I'll tell you something. His voice had broken off, overcome by excitement. He was walking up and down in front of her, his eyes staring wildly. He was going to say something, something about himself. And for a moment she had sat cringing inside. Why had she been afraid? Perhaps because he had looked so wildly around him, like someone trying to escape. But he had grown silent and dropped exhausted into a chair. She tried not to look at him because he was trembling and he had gone away ten minutes later. 
he had kept away for two weeks and then returned and their relations had resumed as if nothing had happened her mind tingled with curiosity but a fear restrained her she somehow had not dared ask the question what were you going to tell me about yourself but she remembered that it had seemed for a moment as if he were going to escape that he had looked like a man on the verge of ridding himself of an incubus her guests were getting along famously everyone seemed pleased happy they were chattering and laughing for hardly no reason at all mrs basine had no liking for the people at her table she despised mrs gilchrist resented aubrey the judge gave her a faint feeling of repulsion Henrietta was a simpleton. Fanny irritated her with her continual blushes and sensitive innocence. Doris was too silent and always brooding. And even George, he somehow failed to convince her, although she desired to be convinced. But all of them together were nice, like a pleasing combination of colors. People belonged together. Alone they had faults but when they came together and forgot themselves they were nice. She felt proud of having them at her table, because there were so many of them. They were nice people when they were like this, just talking, not arguing or saying things that convinced her somehow that they were wrong things. Under the table the little comedies of the day were playing a furtive sequel. Henrietta, sitting next to Basine, was shyly pressing her knee against his. Fanny had reached out her foot until it rested against an ankle she fancied belonged to Aubrey. For a few minutes she failed to connect the attentiveness of Judge Smith, his paternal banter, with her activity under the table. But the suspicion slowly arrived. Her eyes calculated the position of the judge's legs, and, blushing, she withdrew her foot, she noticed that Aubrey sought her face when she wasn't looking, and that Keegan was talking with a blurred politeness to Mrs. Gilchrist. Doris, sitting next to Mr. Ramsey, felt annoyed. He was continually asking her what she wanted, passing her salt shakers and bread plates, and conducting himself as if she were a helpless child under his care. Mrs. Gilchrist, as the first conversational flush inspired by the food subsided, launched into a detailed description of the plans for the coming fete, talking in a precise, emotionless voice. "'I was saying,' Basine's voice emerged in a silence that followed Mrs. Gilchrist's talk, "'I was saying that people are easy to get along with if you understand them and they understand you. I had a case in court the other day, where a woman was suing a man for breach of promise. He had proposed marriage to her, and then, without reason, broke his pledge. The woman was my client. Murmurs of, how awful! That must have been interesting, arose. Basine nodded sagely. He had, without knowing why, started improvising the narrative, inventing its details with a creditable dramatic and legal talent. There had been no such case, client, or denouement, but he continued unconscious of this fact in his desire to tell the story. The man, of course, was a rascal, an unscrupulous rascal. The girl, my client, a charming, innocent young thing, had believed him. He had courted her passionately, or, I should say, assiduously. I couldn't understand how any man, after giving his word and asking a girl to marry him, could possibly be rogue enough to do what he had done. So, during a recess in the case, I sought the fellow out. His name was Jones. We had quite a talk. Basine paused. "'What happened?' Fanny exclaimed. I wish you'd tell us more about your work than you do, George. It's so interesting. Yes, go on, Mrs. Gilchrist commanded. 
Basine hesitated. His improvisation seemed to have come to an end. He was, mysteriously, at a loss as to how to make the lie turn out. But, inspired by the attention of the table, he resumed, "'Well, of course a lawyer must be first of all faithful to his client.' He paused again. He had almost decided to end the fiction by explaining that, on investigation, he had found the man to be right, and that the defense the man had given him privately of his actions had caused him to withdraw from the case. But this would sound quixotic, unreal. There would have to be explanations. Why had he started the lie? To give it that ending so that— he smiled a sudden appreciation of what he was doing, trying to excuse his jilting of Henrietta, an event not far off if she persisted in holding him to the thingamabob foolishness. But he went on, This sometimes prejudices an attorney against his opponent. But I found this time that all prejudice was warranted. The man was a thorough rascal. It had been his practice to propose marriage to girls, innocent girls, of course, and he had several times managed to take advantage of their faith in him and ruin them. Fanny averted her eyes. Mrs. Gilchrist stared with an uncomprehending frown at the talker. The judge permitted a grimace of distaste to pass over his face as he murmured, "'The cad!' Yes, sir, men are cads. My client won, resumed Basine with modesty, and was awarded five thousand dollars by the jury. But the law could not give her back the happiness this scoundrel had snatched from her. Had he, had he accomplished his purpose with her? Aubrey inquired, aloofly interested in the plot details of the narrative. No, fortunately, Basine answered. But look at him now, free, although found guilty, free to continue his tactics. He paused, confused. Henrietta was beaming at him, her eyes wide with admiration. He felt he should have given it the other ending and cursed himself silently for what he had done. He had only made it worse when he had meant to tell a story that would help matters and make her understand. Mrs. Basine regarded her son unhappily. She was convinced he was lying because he usually mentioned the big cases he had, and he had never before referred to any Jones suit. But she was unable to understand why anyone should lie without cause, and after a moment of doubt her son's stern face and positive manner managed to convince her again. He wasn't lying. Basine, as the others took up the discussion of the narrative, dropped his hand to his side and furtively pressed it against Henrietta's knee. At this sensation of physical contact, a feeling of relief came to him. In the sensual thrill this contact aroused, he buried the discomfort of the words running through his head. She thinks I'm going to marry her. Damn it! Damn it! He was startled when, glancing at her in the midst of his daring excursion under the table, he noticed her smiling coolly and primly at Aubrey, who was talking. Will you have some of this? Mr. Ramsey's voice protruded through the silence. Several eyes turned toward him, as if he were about to take up the burden of the talk. Mrs. Basine interrupted quickly. "'What was that book you told me about, Mr. Gilchrist, last month?' she asked. Aubrey looked up inquiringly. "'I mean your father.' The elder Gilchrist blinked and seemed to peer into the depths of his memory. "'I don't remember.' he said, clearing his throat. They were the first words he had spoken since he had said, Thank you, thank you, and sat down in a corner of the Basine library. His wife stared at him as if he were a phenomenon unexpectedly revealed to her gaze. 
"'It must have been,' stammered Mr. Gilchrist, "'Suetonius, I think, or the Chevalier de Boufflaire.' "'I'm sure that was it,' Mrs. Bazine agreed. "'I must get that to read.' the judge frowned disapprovingly upon the elder gilchrist he resented readers culture was a state of soul acquired by being a gentleman not by reading books he resented also the impression aubrey had left during the annexation discussion as a matter of fact he felt sleepy the result of the food he had eaten and he was automatically seeking for some occasion which would warrant an expression of dignity or resentment or anything in which he might hide his heaviness of spirit. The sight of his daughter regarding Aubrey with a sweet, prim attentiveness supplied him with what he desired. The idea of Henrietta marrying that fool was annoying. Old Gilchrist was a sly dog and his wife a difficult woman. He would forbid the thing. It might hurt Henrietta for a time, but he knew what was good for her. A mere story writer had no real standing in the community, no future. Whereas Bazine, he lowered his eyes and glowered at his plate. Nice young man, honorable, and full of promise, promise. End of chapter 8 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 9 of Gargoyles This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline Gargoyles by Ben Hecht Chapter 9 love the stars love people's faces buildings and faces what do i know about em god knows rotten streets life's a great harlot that men keep chasing that gives herself to men all men everybody i want her i want her he walked angrily a cap in his hand a pipe clenched between his teeth he was thinking as he walked. Emotions came out of his heart and burst crests of words in his mind. Angry emotions. There was an anger in him. He was overcoming a feeling of futility as he walked. The street was a carnival fringe. Cheap burlesque theaters, arcades, museums, saloons. This was blurred. He saw no lithographs. One side of the street followed along at his elbow, a slant of pinwheel lights. On the other side across the street, pinpoints. But he saw nothing. Things passed unresistingly through his eyes. He remembered now a mile of walking, the business section asleep on Sunday evening. He had walked through that. Darkened windows, ghastly inanimations. Why was he angry? Ah, uh ha! -huh, he snarled. He was cursing something. He asked questions and answered them. This got him nowhere. Stars, buildings, faces. He wanted to knock them over. That was inside him, a wish to knock them over. More than a wish, a necessity. But he could only walk. The world scratched at his elbow. He could bite on his pipe. This thing hurt him. People, rotten people. Crazy jellyfish with jellyfish hearts, jellyfish brains. He could swear at him like that. But why? He didn't know. Only this thing in him made him blow up. It was easier when he worked. His father calmed him. His father stood over the bench planting the fine-grained wood. A great man, because he loved the wood he cut and carved into pieces of furniture. But jellyfish sat in the chairs they made in his father's shop. Damn him! 
Love people. Say something. What? Say something. Get it out. Ah, the dirty, filthy swine. That was the way he thought as he walked. A long, furious mumble in him. This man walked and saw nothing but light slants, spinning windows. He was young, and he wore a cap. He would get it out of him. Show him. Ah, a nip to the air. Spring blowing his heart up like a balloon. All they wanted was women. And all women wanted was to be wanted. No, that was wrong. Damn, always wrong. His feet talked better than his head. Clap, clap on the pavement. Where were the others going? He didn't hate them. Some day it would all come out like swan swimming. Very majestic. He would talk easy and smooth. But now people kept him from putting it over. They wrapped him up. Ideas wrapped up his words and killed them. Streets, buildings, stars chewed at him. He must knock them over and get himself free. Put his hands on things and knock hell out of them. Love him, love him. How the hell? Why the hell? Lindstrom, Lindstrom, that's my name. I got a name. I'm the greatest man in the world. The world's greatest all-around individual on two legs walking, smoking. Damn. But what could he do? Saw wood, smear varnish on wood, monkey around with wood? That didn't get it out. When he wrote, it came out. But rotten. He wrote rotten, crazy rotten. If he was the greatest man, why in God's name, he'd show him. A long breath brought the night into him like a sponge. It drained something out of him. He could grin. A very evil grin at a saloon window. He could look around and notice. That's what eyes were for. Look, people walking. Poor, sad, broken people. So sad. Ah, tired eyes in the street that looked for lights outside themselves. I'm going nuts. That's what. Nuts. But the mumble went on. Questions and answers in a circle, biting their own tails. God forgive them, all these people. He must do something. Arms around them whispering to their hearts something that would say, Yes, yes, I know it all about you, how you think one way and feel another, and how everything ends, how everything ends in a little cry that goes up. Love their faces. Damn it, love them. He'd show them. He'd talk to the lights in the street. Why not? Do you know what? Do you know? It's all a Humpty Dumpty. Eggheads falling off a wall and smashing. But I know what. I got your number. Wait. There was something to say. Why? Damn it, not that way. Hit poor sad ones on the head. Better the dirty swine in the city hall. Aha! Uh -huh. Ring their necks. What for? Wrong. Something else. They were like him. Brothers. Everybody. You could kill the whole of them, and there would be something left behind that was good. Life. But a better way than that. Don't hit. Arms around them. Lips to their hearts, and talk like that. Make the hyenas sigh. Make the jellyfish weep softly. Make the stars dance in their idiot thoughts. Sing them songs. If only the songs came out. It was evening, spring evening, in a dirty, lighted street, and he walked, biting his pipe. He said to himself, What's there to this thing? Let us study it. Many people in many houses and many streets. 
and each of them a known thing. But when you take all of them together, that's an unknown thing. If you know me, if you know one, what then? Nothing. It remains only one known. There is still everything else to know. One man multiplied by a million isn't a million men, but an infinitude of millions. He would get the hang of them all, though, all the millions. He would think it out, get his fingers on something that didn't exist for fingers to touch. That was art. It was easy when you figured it that way. He walked along, often figuring it that way and understanding something that had no words, living with something that was like a strange phantom in a great dark deep. This phantom was a stranger inside him, a phantom like an insane companion that had a way of putting its arms around him, inside him, and a way of holding him like a horrible mother. Then when it did, he stopped calling himself nuts. Nuts! He became silent then and vanished. The phantom devoured him. All there was of him that everybody knew, that even he knew, all that vanished. The phantom devoured him, and it was easy then. But the phantom let him go, took its arms off him, and he came back, out of the deep. Then he felt himself leaping up with a choke in his lungs, leaping through layers and layers with no surface to reach. He must go up up from the easy embrace of the phantom and keep on raging, yelling out to himself that something had sent him shooting up. Now he walked and it was easy. The night blotted out his eyes and he lived with himself down deep where the easy embrace waited. Such moments came when he walked and he must be careful. That was writing, being careful and watching the little words that danced high up and that he could watch when he raised his eyes from the embrace. Sky rockets far away, he watched them breaking in crazy spatters of light against the top of things where the sky came to an end. He was thinking like that now. Lucid thoughts that he later stared back upon and wondered, what the hell were they? I had something, what was it? Now he was thinking them with this deceptive lucidity, as if they were something. He was thinking how, when he was younger, when he was a boy, he used to run down country roads. Apples, trees, and rivers, and growing fields that sang at night were there. And yet there was nothing. What did that mean? That was easy to answer. There was nothing because it was all outside him in a marvelous way. When he was a boy, long ago, so long ago, and he lay on his back and looked at the night, and the night was nothing in his head, the night was a song that chanted itself to him. The stars were something he had spoken. Darkness was a sentence echoing off his lips. And the world was marvelously outside, and it gave itself to him. The boy lying on his back handed the world to himself as a gift. There was nothing to want, everything to have. Long ago, when he was a boy, watching the day and night, without thinking. But it all went away. Now what was it? That was easy to answer. The night that had been a song chanting itself, the stars that had been his words dancing, the darkness, clouds, trees, rivers and roads, the fields and the people crawling with tiny steps under the cornfield sky, these went away altogether and he couldn't find them any more. These things he had said without speaking, these all went away. Beautiful familiars, they misunderstood something in him and vanished from him. That was long ago. Now he could remember them, and his remembering them was like hearing them again. That's what made him angry. He could hear them as if they were calling, Find us! Find us! And he said back, 
All right, I'll find you. Wait. I'll come after you somehow. You're my old friends. I'll get you back. Christ knows how, but wait. But this made him think he was laughing at himself, kidding himself. He knew better. The things that had gone away were in the faces of people, in buildings, in lights, in streets under his feet. Christ! Why couldn't he lay hands on them again, since they came so close they choked him and made him howl inside with choking? He was letting go now again. The easy embrace was shooting him up, and he began to know again he was nuts. He hung on to himself a little by saying words, Easy, boy, easy. He stopped walking for a second, and a happy smile came to his set mouth. The smile said it was over. He was Leif Lindstrom again, and nobody else. He could become calm like this. It was like blowing a fire out with a grin. His head was clear, and he was happy. The street was like a merry-go-round. The night had a smell of life in it. That came from the lake. Whatever living might be and whatever the choke inside him was, a man was a fool to forget this other, the calm, grinning strength of muscles and the way his nose buzzed when he drew his breath in. Now he was Leif Lindstrom walking to call on his girl. And he could think of others, the poor little others, the superfluous others. Only he didn't have to get angry at them. Or he didn't have to fall in love with them. It was just thinking straight. Well, the way men talked to each other was funny. The way they swapped lies was funny. Poor, rich, happy, sad, broken, bawling ones, they all made the same lies to each other. The government was a lie. God was a lie and all the gabble about good and bad and what not to do and what to do and all the laws and everything beginning from the beginning and going ahead as far as you wanted it was all lies so many of them that all the philosophers had never been able to begin straightening things out and if somebody found out something true what then well they grabbed it and made it into a lie pronto used it as a lie. The poor little crawling ones on the earth made up lies to explain things, but most of all they made up lies to keep alive. If they didn't lie to each other they would all fall apart and vanish because nature would have it that way. So they must go contrary to nature and keep on surviving. Nature demanded the elimination of the unfit but it was the unfit that desired most to live. So the unfit made laws and rules and institutions, and inside them, protected by them, kept alive. So the will to live was the thing that created lies. But the worst lie the little people told was when they called themselves life. That was the chief lie the grand sachem and high god of all lies. Because they were not life. They were part of something inexplicable that altogether might be called life. But each of them separately was a dead one, a dead one buried deep in life. That was the difference about him, Lindstrom. He wasn't buried in life. There were moments when he shot up like a man shooting through layers of graves. The others let the thing called life pile up on them, and it became a mystery of graves that reached to the farthest star. But with him there was no piling up. He would keep on shooting out of it till he had lifted himself up where there were no graves. Shh, shh, he murmured to himself. Let's not be nuts tonight. Plenty of nights for that. Let's talk about other things, about her. Her face was beautiful, dark eyes, dark hair, silent. 
That was like she was. The thought of her made him grimace inside with pain. He wanted her as much as that. But what did he want her for? God knows. What does one want for? In order to get rid of wanting. Nothing else. Kiss her? Bah! She was a victory. He wanted her like that. When he was near her, they didn't have to talk or hold hands. They came together in a different way. She was so beautiful. I love her, he said quietly. He wanted to be quiet, so he spoke quietly. She was marvelous. He would like to cut himself up into bits and give himself that way to her. He would like to die a thousand different ways and say, here, I destroy everything I am in order to become a gift for you. That was like placing oneself on a burning altar, the ecstasy of the sacrificed one. That was it. Some nights like this the world became too small to live in. The city swept away from his senses, and everything in the city seemed like a room full of cheap little broken toys he had outgrown. He would sit in a room with this bigger room, a lamp on his table, and write. Or he would strike out like this time and walk to her, miles across streets. "'I want her,' he said. His thought paused. "'But what do I want of her?' he asked. "'I don't know, but I want to give myself to something.' and he began thinking over how many ways there were to die as a gift. This lighted window was her house. The curtains were down, but light spurted through the sides. The sight of the house, with its light-fringed windows, depressed him. It was a disillusionment. She wasn't a woman then, like he was a man, but she was a part of things. He saw her as he walked up the stone steps, saw her talking to people. She had parents. In his mind she lived as an entity, a beautiful one without background or lighted windows or stone steps. Someone for him, nobody else. He rang. The door opened. A man like himself stood blinking in the lighted hall. "'Good evening!' said Lindstrom. His voice was deep for his age. He spoke in a drawl that seemed edged with anger. "'Is Doris in?' "'Oh, hello!' Basine exclaimed. "'Yes, she's in. Come right in.' People were talking in the next room. "'Company?' said Lindstrom. He didn't want to go in, but Basine was leading the way. The supper had ended ten minutes ago. The company looked up at him. They were all dressed well. Their faces were dressed well, too. They wore carefully tailored satisfactions in their eyes. When they smiled, their mouths postured like ballet dancers in a finale. They were rich people. Their hands were soft. The room blurred before Lindstrom. There was no reason for it now, because he wasn't thinking or caring, but a rage crept into his senses. He breathed in deep with his mouth opened, and the feel of the air in his teeth and tongue made his jaw set. Because he would have to be careful what he said. Because he was saying inside to himself, Damn him, the scum! His eyes brought pictures into his anger. They stared with deliberation into other eyes and brought back messages. He was being introduced. He was saying to himself deep down, They're all alike, like peas in a pod. They smirk and talk alike. And they're all stuck on themselves alike. And they're all liars, damn liars, all alike. He would have to take care and not argue. He would sit down. Doris was upstairs, and she would appear in a minute. Then they would go for a walk and shake this room out of their eyes. They chattered like monkeys. 
satisfied with themselves yes know-it-alls tickled to death with themselves an old man with a heavy pink face and sleepy eyes a well-dressed old man they called judge if he could punch this guy in the face let his fist smash into his jelly face god what a thrill a flushed girl doris's sister wiggled her body in a chair what she needed was somebody to grab hold of her and say come on kid a square hard-faced old woman talking of society what she needed was someone to walk up behind her and kick her hard and when she raised her glasses to look laugh like hell and spit in her eye that would make her human and this smart aleck basine huh what he needed was somebody to tie him to a stake in a dark prairie and let the wind and rain go over him till he got hungry and began to whine that's what they all needed wind and rain to bring them back to life but he must be careful and say nothing there was doris's mother she wasn't so bad but this other guy this writing guy talking about books god why didn't somebody choke the life out of him what did he know about books and he talked about writing what was good writing he asked that this guy did he would have to be careful what he said to this guy and keep himself from jumping up and murdering him hell take all of them and make them burn that's what they needed he hated all of them they were rich damn em he must sit and grin at them these jellyfish who wiggled in their graves and called their wiggles by great names who were dead dead how dead they were and happy about it happy didn't they know how dead they were doris was like them he was a fool for coming to see her as if she were any different from them she belonged with this filthy crew she was a filthy little tart like the rest of them let her go to hell he'd tell her to go to hell when he saw her she was one he could not talk to uh-huh they were giving him the up and down his shoes were dirty his collar soiled his clothes weren't pressed that was the way with these dead ones they made standards of their clothes because clothes were all they had and their idea was to make people feel inferior who were inferior to their clothes or to their manners or to their other artificialities but he didn't have to feel inferior if he didn't want to he was the kind who could stand up in a graveyard like this and say go to hell to the pack of them and grin and walk away and forget all about it he noticed they look at him not quite as they looked at each other that was right they knew he had their number mrs basine too was looking she asked i understand you right mr lindstrom books all bound and pretty standing in a row with your name in the papers as a young writer of note and invitations to speak at women's clubs was what she meant that was what writing was to people to jellyfish i try to write he answered making the correction softly so that his words purred you should know aubrey gilchrist said basine do you know his work i do not said lindstrom still purring what does he write basine chuckled inside his unaccountable aversion for aubrey was growing novels said basine oh said lindstrom dragging the syllable out and placing a huge granite period after it what writers do you like fanny inquired with a successful attempt at social artlessness she was looking for something in this friend of doris's she was in awe of him because he was dirty looking and because he swayed as he sat in his chair 
he kept swaying as if he were on secret springs and would jump up any minute he frightened fanny i read good books said lindstrom books written by men mrs gilchrist sat up stiffly her husband peered out of his glasses he liked lindstrom he wanted to talk to him but he got no further than clearing his throat several times the judge interrupted with a glower he was given the floor eyes turning to him a defender but he merely glowered that was his decision that settled it if he glowered this moujik was done for he glowered lindstrom off the face of the earth but lindstrom turned full on him and thrust his face forward as if he were going to come closer what kind of books do you read he asked the glowerer the snap in his voice startled henrietta she was afraid for a minute this strange-looking creature waiting for doris would do something and she turned appealingly to basine all kinds sir the judge answered in his most effective baritone lindstrom nodded his head slowly and a grin came into his eyes he kept looking at the judge and grinning and nodding his head and just as the judge was going to say something lindstrom abandoned him he had turned to aubrey aubrey had grown eager a confusion inspired by an impulse toward garrulity was in his eyes he wanted to talk to this lindstrom and discuss things beyond everybody in the room Lindstrom thought he was a soda-water clerk, one of those radicals with unbalanced ideas. But he wanted to talk to him. Perhaps they had something in common? Aubrey felt himself growing angry. But it was not an anger of silences, an anger of words. He wanted to talk, to reason with Lindstrom and put himself over with Lindstrom. Lindstrom was like a conscience. Hello! The arrival stood up and looked at Doris. He forgot about calling her names. She was smiling at him like a fresh wind blowing through his heart. The roomful dropped out of sight. Do you want to go for a walk? he asked slowly. It's nice and cold outside. She nodded, and Lindstrom, with a long deliberate stare at the company spoke to them good night he said when he had said it he continued to stare as if he were weighing the matter over carefully and should say something more the pause grew embarrassing but not to him without nodding his head he repeated the result of his deliberations good night he said in the same voice that was enough he left them sitting in their chairs a general calmly marching off the field of victory he left behind a silence the company was uncomfortable mrs gilchrist and the judge stared hard at the doorway through which lindstrom had passed they wanted to insult the doorway lindstrom's visit had had a curious effect upon ramsey he had sat silent and avoided the young man's eyes but he had felt himself becoming animated as if something were exciting him when the young man had glanced at him for a moment he had blushed and an odd nervousness had made his thin body tremble now that lindstrom was gone he felt the room had become empty and entirely lacking in interest how do you like him mrs basine whispered at his side she was worried him oh yes the young man ramsey muttered he he has nice eyes end of chapter 9 recording by roger moline Chapter 10 of Gargoyles. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Gargoyles by Ben Hecht. Chapter 10. In the park, Lindstrom sat on a bench with Doris and talked. All this, he said, all this night and trees and things we feel more than we see are like what you're like. But why should we call that love? Because love means to hold a woman in your arms. I don't care about holding a woman. I want to hold something else. If you hold something in your arms, you haven't got it. It's what you can't get your fingers on that you own most. Because you dream about it. It's what you dream about that you own most. He spoke disconnectedly. There were pauses during which he allowed the night to punctuate his thoughts. "'Have you written any more things since last time?' Doris asked. "'No, I didn't bring anything with me.' He was silent. Doris wished he would sit closer to her. His silence excited her. She could feel things moving in him. She became nervous. Her dark eyes looked fully at his profile, and a pride elated her. Other men didn't stare like that into the night. They had fussy little eyes and fussy little bodies. They fidgeted around. But Leaf sat as if he were turned to granite. There was something ominous about him. The glint of his straight eyes and the leather color of his face were ominous. She felt that he was powerful, more powerful than the spaces he stared into. He could stand up and swing the park around their heads. She wanted to come close to him. Leaf, she whispered, why don't you come oftener? I get lonely for you. I hardly talk to anybody else." He nodded, as if agreeing with her and saying silently, "'That's right. Don't talk to anybody else.' But he said nothing aloud. She wanted to be the thing he swung around his head. If he would take her up and destroy her, it would make her crazy with happiness. She closed her fingers around his hand and trembled. Her body felt weak. Her arms were as if she no longer directed them. They were being drawn. "'I'm so proud of you. You're so different from all of them, Leaf. I can't stand them sometimes. They're terrible.' He nodded his head with a ponderous air of sagacity. "'They make me sick,' she went on. "'All of them. They're not like people, but something else. Like parts of people.' He nodded his head again. She was all right, this girl. She didn't belong with the pack in the room he had left. She wasn't a little slut, one of those lying filthy ones. But he was afraid of her. He wanted to keep things like they were. If you let down to a woman, she started climbing all over you and asking for this and for that. Anyway, it was time to walk back now. There was a lot of work in the shop. He got up at six. They walked out of the park together. The spring night called for endings. The darkness hinted. The day, with its houses and noises, lingered like an unnatural memory in the shadows. What were people for? The darkness hinted. Doris felt a mist in her blood. So curious, the day unreal, empty, noises that circled, faces that went on forever. People had been moving forever. They kept walking and walking. There was no ending to people. The years passed under their feet like a treadmill, and they kept moving on. Now it was quiet. Beside this man she felt there was no more moving on. Her heart filled with impatience. It was hard to breathe. Her arms were heavy, overcrowded. Oh, she whispered to herself, I'll die, I'll die. But they continued to walk. The man's silences, his ominous reserves, 
his sagacious noddings had excited her she felt angry with him he had called for her a half dozen times in the last two months they had met by accident in a bookstore a clerk had introduced them he called and they went for walks but he said nothing once he had told her she was beautiful another time he had mentioned as if it were a casual thing that she was the sort of girl to whom he would like to make a gift. But of what he didn't know. Some gift worthy, he said. She had been frightened of him at first, but gradually, as she grew accustomed to his strange manners, his bristling silences, she became impatient, angry. He stopped. I'll go this way, he announced. Good night. He stood looking at her for a long minute, and then, turning, walked away. She watched him, but he didn't look back. She walked to the house alone. Her thoughts now were clear. He was a man who didn't want her, but was looking for something of which she was a part. He never tried to touch her. He never said, I love you, to her. But he did love. She knew that. He called it by other names and misunderstood himself. And he might go on that way till he died, misunderstanding himself. To be near her thrilled him. She remembered how he became taut, immobile, sitting on the bench. His arms quivered, yet he never tried to embrace her. She thought about this as she walked to her home. Would he ever embrace her? She knew about his silences. She could even feel how he suffered inside because something was urging him that had no direction. It was this life in him that lured her. It stirred her senses. Nothing before had interested her. Days had passed with no difference in them. Now he made a difference. When she remembered him, a pain that was like anger filled her. She would go to bed and lie in the dark, dreaming of him with her eyes open. A languor made it difficult to walk. She smiled to herself. It was pleasant, sweet to think of him. For a moment the image of his face transfixed her. She whispered aloud, Talk to me, oh please, please. Then images that disgusted her crowded her thought. They came of their own volition. Her sister Fanny kissing men. Her brother George kissing women. Keegan, the judge, Ramsey, Aubrey, and Henrietta. They disgusted her with their continual love-making, kissing, dirtiness. People like that didn't understand anything else. Their bodies searched each other out and clung to each other. Bodies clenched together. She began to rage in silence against them. He called them the pack. They were like that, a pack of animals with nothing else but animal bodies to live with. She paused in her hating, a chill coming between her silent words. The company of images in her mind had dissolved. Their faces came together and blurred into a single face and she saw Leif Lindstrom holding her wildly against him, his lips open and hot against her mouth. The company had gone. Her family was left in the library. She had intended going upstairs without speaking, but she came into the room and sat down. Fanny looked at her with a questioning innocence that said, "'Dear me, I wonder what people do who walk in the park at night.' Her brother was talking. He looked at her with a smile and went on. "'You mustn't think I'm a blockhead, mother, about these people here tonight, for instance, just because I get along with them. I'll give you my theory of people.' "'We were discussing our guests,' he explained, turning to Doris. She nodded. "'Never believe them,' he grinned. "'They're all liars.' The thing to do is to lie better than they. Honesty, purity, nobility, bah! 
I know what I'm talking about. That's what people tell each other they are. And they are, of course. Till they're found out. You said a little while ago I was lying. Of course I was. But not the way you mean. That breach of promise case really happened. I wasn't lying about that. You wait. You'll understand what I mean after a few years. I'm going to do things. He stood up and yawned. Mrs. Bazine smiled happily at him. The day had tired her. She felt pleasantly responsible for her three children, three human beings that belonged to her. At least she could pretend they did. And sometimes it was almost as nice dreaming of what they had in their minds as planning her own tomorrows. Basine went to his bedroom. He undressed and lay down. Sounds continued in the house. Doris coming upstairs. Fanny chattering to his mother. Water running in the bathroom. He turned the gas out and lay with his face toward the window. His body was weary. But he felt young. He thought of the many years ahead of him. Everything was new. Even the century had just begun. A new century. Life was a gay unknown. He thought about things. Things filled the future. They could not be seen or understood, but their presence could be felt. Unlived years stretched ahead like a track without end. He must be careful not to grow too serious. Lying was easy, but he must avoid getting tangled up. Say anything you want to, but look out how hard you say it. People were easy. It would all come out beautifully. Success, power, fame, money, happiness, they were all easy. They would all come to him. People were fools, and you could get ahead of them. He yawned. He almost fell asleep. His mind mumbled with words. His daydreams, his memories, his weariness jumbled dim pictures. Phantoms drifted without outline over his head. He fell asleep and dreamed he was in a brightly lighted hall. Men were cheering. Music played and people were yelling his name. In the dream he was going to make a speech. The brightly lighted hall grew larger and the crowd reached as far as he could see but he didn't come out to make the speech. Instead, a woman in a gaudy dress came out. Her face was white with powder and heavily painted. Her eyes were sunken. In the dream he shuddered because the great crowd would rave indignantly at the substitute who had come out to make the speech for him. But instead, a tremendous cheer went up at the sight of this woman, and everybody yelled, Bazine! Bazine, there he is! Hooray for Bazine! They mistook the woman for him. The woman began to make his speech, the one he had prepared. She spoke in a tired, hollow voice, but the crowd continued to cheer. Where was he in the dream? There was no Bazine in the dream. He kept wondering about this. There was no Bazine. But the crowd thought this woman in the gaudy dress with the painted face was Bazine, and they cheered her for him, calling her Bazine, while he, hiding somewhere, the dream didn't say where, listened to the woman and the cheers and the shouts of his name. He was saying to himself with a feeling of horror, I know that woman they think is me. It's that woman Keegan and I met once. Keegan and I met her, by God. He was going to stop something, but the dream went away. End of chapter 10 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 11 of Gargoyles This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline Gargoyles by Ben Hecht 
Chapter 11 The city grows and keeps on growing. People vanish. Buildings spring up to take their places. The streets become full of vast, intricate activities. People have vanished, but these activities keep on growing. The city shakes with noises. A cloud of noises rises from the street and bursts slowly into names. Everywhere one turns, doors and windows chatter with names. Names run up and down the faces of buildings. Gilt names that slant downward. Porcelain names curve like lopsided grins. Names fly from banners, hang from long wires, lean down from rooftops. The city is plastered with names. Tired men stop and blink. They mutter to themselves in the street, Let's see, where am I? Their eyes stare at an inanimate dance of names. Names fall out of the sky. An alphabet face with eyebrows, nose, lips, and hair made of names winks and sticks out its tongue. These are not the names of people, but of activities. As the city grows, the names pile up and reach higher. Names of things to eat, wear, see, feel, smell, dream of, and die for. They become too many to see and far too many to read. They drift up and down the faces of the buildings and scamper over the pavements like a lunatic writing. The vanished people no longer look at them, but the names continue to pile up and spread out. They are a city apart. They no longer offer clues to people. They are no longer advertisements yelping vividly out of the air, but a decoration. Inscrutable hieroglyphs that salute each other in the grave confusion of windows. They grimace with secret meanings at each other and keep each other company in the night sky. Like the people, they too have become too many. As the city grows, their meanings and purposes also vanish, leaving behind a comet's tail and a deaf and dumb goodbye. The city grows and devours itself and ceases to become articulate in names. It shakes and howls senselessly. No one understands where the noises come from or why. Windows become too many to count. Activities double on themselves and tangle themselves up in other activities until each activity becomes a mystery to itself. Businessmen buried in business pause to blink at their desks and mutter, Let's see, where am I? Underneath the activities and the comet's tale of names, the vanished ones crawl about their business of destinations. They have remained sedately unaware of their disappearance. They have barricaded themselves behind activities, and for the most part they are silent. Their activities talk for them in a language easy to hear but difficult to understand. Furnaces, engines, factories, traffic, these talk. Their talk is very important. It is curious that for the simple business of keeping alive there should be so many activities necessary. It is also incomprehensible. Among themselves, people offer each other informations and interpretations. But these informations and interpretations are not of their souls, but of their activities which have nothing to do with them except to hide them. They talk of business enterprise, of success, progress, civic development, industrial achievement, political ideals, of money made and money spent. This talk sounds very important. It becomes an important part of the confusion of activities. Faces uncoiling in the streets, legs slanting against dark walls, suits of clothes, these are the vanished people. Masses of rich and poor moving on, everlastingly moving on through the whirl of years. Age, like a tenacious pestilence, shovels them off a treadmill. 
yet they remain and increase and become hidden from each other by their too many selves, hidden from themselves by their too many activities. They grow confused and stop staring at each other. They walk listening to the shake of the city, blinking at the alphabet face above them. The city is a great bubble they have blown. It floats over their heads and grows greater and more dazzling. Slowly it sinks down and engulfs them. This bubble talks for them. Activities talk for them. It is easier that way. Activities say, We the people. This suffices. The vanished ones point with relief to the glitter of activities and repeat, There we are. But activities grow too fast and too intricate to understand. The burst of names becomes too violent to grasp. Then the people lost in their bubble become an insupportable mystery to themselves. Buried beneath activities that grow by themselves, that seem to pulse with mathematical passions, and to multiply like a devouring fungus, the vanished ones send up a clamor for whys and wherefores. An official clamor. Life has become an enigma deeper than death. The cry is no longer, Who is God, and where does he live? But, Who are we, and what are we? Surveying themselves, they see nothing, and demand explanations of this phenomenon. Baffled by their anonymity, they demand identifications. They want to be assured that things are all right, that their burial is okay. And thus new explainers and identifiers leap daily into existence. These are the bombinators, the dexterous geniuses able to translate the insupportable mystery of life. Life is a mumble-mumble, a pointless delirium. People feel this and grow very serious. They feel life is a little breath, a whimsical zephyr capered for a moment through space. But these are insupportable feelings. It is easy for the fish in the sea to feel like that, but in people there is a mania for direction. Out of this mania is born the necessity of illusion, the illusion of direction. There must be illusion. Life is not a mumble-mumble, but a clear voice teeming with precisions. Not a pointless delirium, but a vast, orderly activity that has names, too many names to count. As children demand lights in the darkness, grown older they demand illusions in life. Their reasoning is simple. We are so puny, they think. There is hardly anything to us. We dare not dream or even think. Look what would happen if we allowed ourselves to dream. We would begin asking impossible questions of ourselves. Why are we? What lies under our senses? So we must put away dreams and thought. They're dangerous. But without them we become insufficient to ourselves. We become incomplete. So make us a part of something outside ourselves that we may remain unaware of our insufficiency. Make us a part of laws and ideas, gods, systems, and activities. We are frightened by what we do not know. And above the highest names in our buildings is a circle of unknowns. Dispel this circle so that we may be rid of our fear. Give us paths to traverse, goals to struggle toward, and make these paths and goals outside ourselves. We dare not adventure inside ourselves, because that way is inimical. Inspire us with great outward purposes, so that the inward purposelessness of our lives that would devour us in enigmas will be obscured. The illusion-bringers arise, dexterous craftsmen able to fashion purposes, gods, ideals. Their work is to create heroic destinations to invent objectivity. These are the geniuses. 
they provide the sanities which are the vital solace for terror they invent masters because masters are necessary since to have a master is to have an objective servitude the instinct for servitude is an old unfailing friend it represents the clamor for an outward purpose to conceal the inner purposelessness of the vanished ones and the geniuses are those in whom the instinct for servitude inspires new visions of lovelier masters thus is progress made by increasing and making more definite the demands of masters once the geniuses found their task simple now it grows difficult famous masters famous illusions famous objectives lose their value their capacity for solace dwindles the illusion of god grows dim the illusions that bore the names zeus buddha moses jesus mohammed are fading the knees of the race have stiffened with vanity and prayer grows difficult the great heavens overladen with their angel choirs and hierarchies tumble about the ears of people slowly the reservoirs of faith in consoling myths dry up epigrams have almost sponged away one of the immemorial deeps of the soul the geniuses cast about inventing new masters masters who will reward and punish and establish paths to traverse and goals to achieve as the activities increase and as people vanish deeper under the self-growing fungus of finance industry government they develop a paradoxical vanity a vanity by which they seek to preserve themselves a vanity becomes necessary that will save them from the knowledge of their inferiority to life their age-old illusion of gods on high drifts away the new illusion slowly unfolds again the reasoning is simple the race speaks there is no longer a god or a heaven of futures the words eternity and infinity are bottomless and no longer hold us or guide us but we must have a master one who will enable us to dream of his recompense since we still dare not adventure in dreams of our own and this master must assure us as our old master did that there are great purposes in life great rewards we will make a minor change in our theology once it was our desire to think of ourselves as having been created in the image of god a superior this was when we were strong when we walked the earth and wore our destinies like gay feathers in our caps now we have grown diffused and weak the world is no longer simple enough for us to understand and ignore we dare not ignore our disappearance from life therefore in order to compensate for this disappearance we will create a god in our image and worship him the deeper we sink the further we vanish the higher nobler and more powerful will we make our new god come illusion mongers we desire a new god we desire a new heaven make us a heaven of quicksilver in which we may not see jehovah who is a myth but our own image glorified which is closer to reality and which our dawning intelligence may more easily swallow in this heaven let us see our civic virtues magnified we want for a master an idealization of ourselves whom we may serve in hope of rewards thus the vanished ones stare aloft and slowly the heavenly mirror spreads itself for them a mirror of identifications and explanations it is all clear or at least it grows clear in this mirror who we are and what we are a beautiful image marches across its face it is the image of the vanished ones ennobled and deified become a new illusion become a godlike creature with flashing eyes 
a marvelous, unsurpassable creature whose every gesture is perfection, whose every grimace is unsurpassable perfection. A reassuring God. Whatever their moods, their despairs, their manias, they have only to look up and see them ennobled and deified in the mirror heaven. Gazing aloft, the vanished ones raise their voices in a cheer of triumph. We are confused. We have disappeared. Our activities have devoured us. But we are not afraid. For behold, whatever we do, we remain God. See our reflection. We are always and consistently perfect. Our stupidities, hysterias, bewilderments shine back at us out of this new heaven as godlike attributes. Wisdom and victory smile at us eternally out of our mirror. Let the city devour itself and become a jungle of names. Let life lose itself in the labyrinth of activities. Let the buildings devour life until it becomes less than a tiny warmth under huge ribs of steel. These things are no longer insupportable. There is an answer always to who are we and what are we? We are God. By worshipping ourselves we may now dispel the dawning knowledge of our insufficiency. The old God is dead. He was an illusion. The new God alone now has the power to punish and reward. We will kneel with fanatical servitude before the image of our virtues and punish ourselves with a terrible justice in order to appear godlike in our own eyes. Slowly the new heaven above the city grows, and the vanished ones with the eyes of Narcissus stare enchanted into its quicksilver depths. End of chapter 11 Recording by Roger Moline Chapter 12 of Gargoyles this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. Gargoyles by Ben Hecht. Chapter 12. In the days that followed her walk with Lindstrom in the park, Doris Bazine abandoned herself to her passion for the man. Her body desired him. She dreamed of their coming together as of some transcendental climax. But the months passed, and Lindstrom held himself aloof. She felt certain of herself, though. It was only necessary to wait. She could go on dreaming of him and waiting, too. To think of him, to remember he was alive, this, for the time, was happiness enough. After a number of months they saw each other oftener. He seemed to grow more dependent on the fanatical admiration of her eyes and words. Her flattery stirred an excitement in him that he was learning to utilize in writing. The fact that he was loved made it easier to write. The memory of the things she said, of the desire in her eyes, was like music. It was easier to write with music playing in his head. But the more he wrote and dreamed of writing, the less he desired her. So her passion became an applause urging him from her. He would listen trembling to her gradually shameless avowals. "'You're so wonderful, so remarkable. You're the only man in the world that's alive. Your genius is something I can't even talk about. It must be worshipped. I love you.' In the midst of such monologues she would suddenly vanish from Lindstrom's thought. Her beauty and desire were powerless to hold his attention. Her enfevered praise would become a lash that drove him into himself, and trembling with the passion that her love had aroused, he would leave her. But it would be a passion which demanded possession not of her, but of himself. He would walk excitedly to his room over his father's shop and sit down to write. After many months Doris began to understand. He brought her poems he had written poems like night music and passion music. 
she felt his heart throbbing among their words. Even his body was in them. What she wanted of him he gave to the poems he wrote. She announced herself at home as tired of her surroundings and dependents. Through the aid of a friend, she secured a job as clerk in a large bookstore. One evening she came home to tell her mother she was going to move. Basine entered the argument that followed. To her surprise, he took her side, agreeing with her that a modern young woman had a better chance of realizing herself if she lived alone and made her own way. Mrs. Basine refused to be convinced. Not about the theories, she explained, but about Doris. When her two children argued with her, she felt herself the victim of a conspiracy. Why did Doris want to leave her home? And why did George want her to? The answers didn't lie in the arguments they gave. But because she was unable to determine what the answers were, she assented. Later, she thought, If I haven't given my consent, she would have done it anyway. This way I've saved her from being disobedient. Doris took up her life in a two-room apartment on the near north side of the city. The district was alive with rooming houses, little stores, lovers who walked hand in hand at night, artists who tried to paint, writers who worked as clerks and tried to write, working men, artisans, derelicts. Everyone seemed alone in this district and on warm evenings groups of strangers sat stiffly on the stone steps of the houses and stared at the sky. Doris was able to live on her salary. She made friends, and her evenings were devoted to conversations. But they were a curious type of friends. They were men and women one got to know only by their ideas. One became acquainted with their ideas, then familiar with them, then on terms of intimacy with them. It had been different at home. At home she knew men and women as they were. They sat around and talked, and if you listened to what they said, you came close to them. You understood them, and when they said good night, you knew where they were going. You knew all about them, where they worked, their family, their homes. They grew into familiars as uninteresting and unmysterious as your own relatives. But here, where Doris had come to live, were men and women about whom you never learned anything. They talked and talked, but all the while you wondered where they worked, what things were in their hearts. You wondered how they lived and what they did all the time. But you never found out. Such informations were not a part of the talk that went on. It was all talk about outside things, about politics and women and art. Everybody in the circle Doris entered became familiar in a short time. But after they had become familiar, there remained this mystery about them. What sort of people were they under their poses and behind their words? The most curious change her freedom brought Doris was a garrulity that surprised even herself. She became adept in arguments vindicating the emancipation of her sex and proving that the ideals and standards by which women lived were the rose-covered chains forged for their enslavement by man. But her garrulity did not deceive Doris. She grew more clearly aware of herself. She knew that her entire upheaval, her taking up new ideas, her repudiating conventions had been inspired by a single factor. She wanted to live alone in a room so there would be no difficulty in giving herself to Lindstrom when the opportunity came. With this in mind, she had deliberately converted herself into a new woman, since an expression of the new womanhood was independence of family, and since independence of family meant a room to herself. Of this subterfuge Doris became tolerantly aware. Her hypocrisies did not concern her. In her desire for the man she loved, the surfaces of her life disappeared like straws in flame. Lindstrom had visited her in her new quarters with misgivings. 
When he was alone he often sat thinking of her and repeating her ardent phrases. This helped him to make love to himself, to seduce the strange companion who lived in the depths of his soul into embracing him. Out of this embrace came words. Out of the ecstasy these hypnotisms induced, he was able to create gigantic phrases, mystic sequences of words whose reading often inspired people with an excitement similar to the emotion that had produced them. Women in particular grew emotional at the contact of his written words. When he read his poetry to some of them, who were his friends, they closed their eyes and thought he was making love to them. Lindstrom, utilizing the adoration Doris gave him as a means of self-seduction, remained aware of the danger this offered. The danger was summed up in the word marriage. At twenty-six, his sexual impulses found sublimated outlet in the orgies of self-seduction which he called his creative work. Thus his physical nature clamored for no other mate than his own genius, and the lure of marriage as a legalized debauch failed to touch him. His egoism likewise found a more perfect surfeit in his own self-admiration than in that of others. He saw in marriage merely a forfeit of his privacy and an intruder upon his self-love. Dora, studying him carefully from behind her abandonment, discovered the barrier. "'I don't want ever to marry,' she explained to him. This started talk in which Lindstrom defended marriage as an institution. He grew eloquent on the subject that society and civilization were dependent upon marriage, and that a man who sought to dispense with it was merely being unfaithful to himself as a member of society. Dora saw through the angry phrases of her friend that he was trying to tell her how little he desired her. He was defending marriage and proclaiming his belief in it, in order to excuse his physical indifference toward her, both in his own eyes and hers. Since she had said she thought marriage was an abomination, he could safely defend it without compromising himself. He need have no fear that she would agree with him. In this way, his pose as a moralist was a convenient method of concealing the fact that he had no impulse toward immorality. He could even insist with impunity that she marry him and so use her rhetorical stand against marriage in general as a personal refusal. Doris allowed matters to drift through the year. One winter night Lindstrom, invited innocently to occupy the sofa in the studio rather than to tackle the storm-bound transportation outside, consented. He sat reading things he had written until midnight came. He did not see how it happened, but when he looked up after one of his readings, Doris was sitting before the small great fire. Her face was turned from him, and he stared at her. She had undressed and slipped a green silk robe over her body. Her black silk stockings gleamed like exclamation points in the firelight. Her throat and breasts were visible, and the shadows mirrored themselves in her white arms. As he looked at her, the warmth of the room seemed to bring her closer. He thought her beautiful and standing up went to her side. His hand sought clumsily to caress the hair coiled on her head. He stood silent, remembering how she loved him. Always the thought excited him, but now he seemed to be thinking about it with a curious calm. There was something about a woman who loved that was beyond the words to figure out. She looked up at him with a smile. A faint odor stirred from her. He found himself drawing deep breaths and staring at her with a heavy pain in his arms. The pain she had always brought to him and out of which he had made his words. Now this was easier, simpler, to reach his arms around her. "'I belong to you now,' she whispered as the dawn lighted the room. The fire in the grate still burned feebly. They had kept it alive during the night. "'You see,' 
she went on, I was right about not marrying. We can love each other like this without marrying ever. Oh, I love you so. You make me so happy. Yes, he murmured sleepily, intent upon the whitening room. Dawn, the white shadow of night, whispered itself through his mind. But he said nothing. After an interval he repeated as if delivering himself of innumerable ideas. Yes. Lindstrom slowly extricated himself from the lure of her passion. For months her love, dissolving rapturously in his embrace, remained a flattery too bewildering to resist. He allowed himself then to yield to the slowly accumulating demands of his mistress. Nevertheless, in a month he had lost interest in his own sensations. The thought of impending embraces in the studio failed to arouse him. There was nothing Doris had to give that was comparable to the delicious elation his own self-seduction held for him. But although the physiology of sex lost its attraction for him, he remained interested in Doris's submission. Her delight in his caresses and her exclamations of arduous love fascinated him as a species of applause. He grew able to resist the contagion of her sensualism and to make her happy, without essentially occupying himself. In the second year of their association he gradually undermined her passion. Aware of his complete coolness, Doris fought successfully to suppress the ecstasies he was able to stir in her. Their relations by degrees returned to a platonic basis. Lindstrom was becoming known. His poetry printed in fugitive labor gazettes was attracting a slight attention. He was being identified as a poet of the masses. The masses, however, unable to understand, let alone appreciate the mystic imagery and elusive passion of his vers libre phrasings, remained oblivious to him. They continued to read and swear by the newspaper jinglers, celebrating in rhyme the platitudes which kept them in subjugation. His fame was beginning through the enthusiasm of a few scattered dilettantes who abhorred the masses and saw in his work an intense technique and high aesthetic quality. He remained loyal to Doris in one respect, still coming to her for the adulation which somehow quickened his desire to write. But Doris, with the repression of her own desires, had grown silent. She appeared to relapse into her former self, the enigmatic and disdainful virgin of the Basine Library. But this simulation included only her mannerisms. As a girl of twenty, she had been without thought, now a strange intellectualism preoccupied her. It developed when she was twenty-three, and when Lindstrom was beginning to ignore her again. It began with the knowledge that there were definite preoccupations luring her lover from her. Against one of these she knew herself powerless. This was his desire to write. She had understood this thing in Lindstrom from the first. It had been, in fact, the lure of the man. But now it had taken entire possession of him and had become her rival. He had grown dumb. His gray eyes no longer smiled or roved. They gazed without movement as if fixed on invisible objects. They seemed without sight, yet there was life in them, an intensity like the anger of blindness. He no longer looked at things. He avoided contact with the visible and imposed a deliberate fog on his vision. He went through his day unaware of details, yet absorbing them, unseeing yet translating the commonplaces around him into phenomena that tugged at the hearts of his few readers. Doris knew the futility of combating in her lover the habit of self-seduction now became a vital necessity. She tried to establish a harmony between them by turning to writing herself. The clarity of her mind made poetry impossible. 
her thoughts refused to dissolve into magnificent blurs. Her emotions were too definite to find solacing outline in ambiguous pirouettes. She envied her lover his natural aptitude for poetry. It seemed to her a comforting and satisfying evasion to write poetry. There were no rules of logic, coherence, technique. There was even no rule of intelligibility. There was a man named Levine with whom she discussed matters of this sort, exchanging definitions with him of such things as life, love, and art. He was a Jew and worked on a newspaper. Lean, vicious-tongued, and unkempt, the fantastic skepticism of this man attracted her. He was a man without principles, ideas, prejudices. His attitude toward life she sensed to be a pose. But he had been completely consumed by this pose, and the pose was one of superiority. His brain was like a magician. It waved words over ideas or problems, and they turned inside out. Or they vanished and reappeared again as their opposites. He appeared to devote himself with a mysterious enthusiasm to proving everyone but himself in the wrong. When he read editorials in the newspapers, he would comment, They say this, but they mean this. And he grew elated explaining the low, sordid motives which inspired the noble-phrased pronouncements in the press and elsewhere. When she talked to him about poetry one evening, he knew her well enough to understand she wanted to talk about Lindstrom. Doris had tried her hand at poetry, and the results had been, in a measure, satisfactory. Poems had come out under her pencil. She compared them coldly with things Leaf had written. They were as good and better. She offered them to Levine to read. He nodded after each one and smiled. Very nice, excellent, superb. Then he handed them back to her and added, I've always known this. Anybody can write poetry. This poetry is quite good. But it remains, you're no poet and he recited from memory a few lines of Lindstrom's work. "'You see the difference,' he said. "'His rings truer, although yours is much more lucid and beautifully written. The difference isn't between your work and his, but between your work and yourself, and his work and himself. When Lindstrom wrote that, he felt a thrill of satisfaction.' He had for a minute completed himself in the poem. Therefore, the thing represented a certain perfection. When you wrote, you felt nothing after writing it. In an hour, the whole thing seemed rather senseless and unworthy of you. You felt no thrill of completion. This shows that no matter if you write a dozen times better than Lindstrom, the fact remains that you're not a poet, and he is. But why write poetry? I have a friend who says that poetry is an impish attempt to paint the color of the wind. He hasn't written any himself yet, but he will. But I've warned him. He'll never succeed. Lindstrom will, because Lindstrom has the faculty of rising above logic. He can recreate his emotions in words. Emotion is unintelligent, banal, wordless. The trick of being a great poet is to make your mind subservient to your emotion. The triumph of matter over mind, in other words. He noticed an inattentiveness and stopped. He hoped some day to make love to her, but as long as she remained interested in his verbal jugglings, he was content with that. When she was alone, Doris took a morbid interest in unraveling ideas and attenuations of ideas. Morbid because the process seemed to bring a melancholy to her. But she persisted. There was an elation. Thinking was like a game in which one surprised oneself with denouement. One day, while walking, she reasoned silently about her situation. Her love for Lindstrom had grown. 
At times it felt on her like a despair. She would lie in the dark of her room repeating to herself that she would go mad unless he came back to her, unless he loved her. Walking swiftly, she began to think of her plans. Her plan centered upon bringing him back to her arms. "'If I'm going to do this, I must first of all be clear about myself,' she thought. "'I've become interested in lots of things. I must find out why and what started me.' The answer that came to her was one of the denouement of the game. It repeated, but clearly, that she was chiefly concerned with bringing Leaf back to her, and that one way to do this was to become keener than he, become brilliant enough to deflate him, to confuse him. And this could best be done by attacking his subject matter, by turning his conceptions of life and people upside down, and so throwing him out of gear. When she got home she was still thinking. What I must do is make him think. He doesn't think. The pictures he sees pass like blurs through his eyes and come out like blurs under his pencil. If I can make him think, he'll have to open his eyes. He'll have to defend what he accepts without defenses now, the nobility of the masses, the beauty of life. And if he starts thinking and doubting, he won't be able to write because he's not built to write that way. He's built to write out of passion. The idea became cruelly apparent in her mind. She must destroy Lindstrom in order to possess him. She must beat down the passionate certitude of the man, puncture his blind, roaring egomania, take away from him his genius, and then he would turn to her. Her thought at this point gave itself over to the passion in her. Anger filled her and a strange viciousness, as though she had something under her hands to tear to pieces. Her clear-thinking mind was a weapon, a thing she could use to destroy a rival with. And if it destroyed Leaf along with the rival, what matter? Slowly the morbidity of her position grew. Levine was an ally. His talk gave her ideas, directions in which to think. She disliked his attitude. The man was an insincerity. There was also something unctuous and cowardly about him. He never stood up for his notions in the face of conservatively indignant people. He capitulated and even denied his beliefs or lack of beliefs. Yet in the nihilism to which he pretended she found a background for her own thinking. Nihilism to Levine was a conversational pastime. To Doris it became a despairing hope for salvation. She pored over books, carefully questioned the secrets of life, not like a philosopher seeking answers, but like a Messalina questing for poisons. Her debates with Lindstrom were at first casual and good-natured. A humility before his genius made her unable to assert herself. He could hurl his mystic word sequences at her, and their beauty made her incapable of appreciating their lack of psychological content. But her determination grew. She must destroy. What? the somber ecstasy which the spectacle of people awoke in him. People! People! The word contained the shape and soul of her rival. People! Workers, toilers, underdogs. He sang of their bruised hearts and their little gropings. Songs of unfulfilled dreams, of moods like ashen baskets that broke under the weight of life coal miners, farmers, stevedores, vagrants, desperados, drowsy clerks and fumbling factory hands, the dull faces of the immemorial crowd sweating for its living, grunting under its burdens. His phrases hymned their loneliness and their defeats. Beautiful phrases that seemed almost the work of a fantastic word-weaver. But she knew better. The little images, 
the patterns of street scenes, the aloof fragments of idea, these might be to some only decorations. The curve of a pick going through the air, the shake of a great trestle with an overland train thundering across, the glint of a night torch under the eyes of a section gang, these might be only abstractions outlining bits of rhythm and color. But then Lindstrom would not have been a poet. There was beneath them, buoying them higher and higher like some mysterious, invisible force, a passion. It escaped now and then from between the lines of his work, shaking itself like a fist, holding its arms out like a lost woman. Threats crept out of the placid little images in which fragments of street scenes postured vividly for the eye. A fury loomed suddenly behind the mumble of a hurdy-gurdy piece. A snarl offered itself as invisible punctuation for a fol de roll of city life. It was a passion that identified itself with, and seemed to flatten upon, the injustices of life. It sought to champion the war of the crowd against man and nature. The humble ones, the humble ones, it sang, they are God. The ones life walks upon, the working ones, the cheated ones, here is their song. The oppressed ones, listen to their hearts beating. It was a passion out of which a great propagandist might have been born. But Lindstrom's mind was too simple to utilize it, even to understand it. He was aware only of a torment that seemed to twist at his heart and bring words like soothing whispers into his thought. A craftsman obsession molded it slightly. But always the inarticulate excitements that had started him writing remained fugitive among his written words, saying neither, I hate, nor I love but affirming with a monotonous crescendo, I am, I am. Doris caught by the fanatic lyricism of his songs, yielded her intellect to them for a time. The shoemaker Wotans and hobo Christs startled her into an acquiescence. But she was determined. She knew that her praise of his poetry was like an admiration of his infidelity. Yes, he loved people as he might have loved her, blindly with his heart, with his arms around their bodies and his gray eyes looking hungrily through them. The debates grew less casual. There were abrupt climaxes during which he stared at her with anger. Then it was no longer a debate of ideas, but of wills. Here she knew herself powerless and yielded at once, making use of her apology to caress his face or seize his hand. Alone again, she would study the things she had said as she studied from day to day the social, political, and spiritual history of her own and other times. Her mind grew to master the phrases which outlined the illusions of the crowd, which revealed the lusts and errors of the crowd her thought inspired by the single desire to destroy for her lover the beauty of her rival, rallied continually from its defeats before his anger. Her cynicism became a mystic thing, her adoration of her lover turning into a hatred of life, a contempt of people. At night she sat in the window of her room, overlooking the thinly crowded street. The obsession held her now, occupying her energies entirely. In its excitement, in the mental twistings, she found rest from the desires that burned. Alone, she was alone. She would play languorously with this sense of loneliness. She would repeat quietly, He'll never come to me again, never hold me in his arms. How beautiful he is! His lips are not like any man's lips could be. But he doesn't love me any more. He loves this in the street below. Men and women in the street. And here her thinking would begin, a sequel to the preface of sorrow. Below her moved the face of her rival, the crowd. She must study the thing out carefully, 
so as to be clear in her words when she talked to him, so as to make her words a poison in him that would destroy the passion for her rival. The night lifted itself far away. Little lights ran a line of yellow at the foot of buildings. Men and women. What were men and women? The blur of faces in the street, moving along every night, what was that? something to idealize and give one's soul to no individuals racing toward their secret destinations and tumbling with a sigh into an inexhaustible supply of graves that was a phenomenon to be studied separately out of that one could locate plots dramas humor tragedy but here below the window was another story was a great character that had no name but that her lover worshipped the crowd this thing in the street he sang of as the crowd was a single creature its face was one its voice one it had one soul the soul of man a dark thing alive with inscrutable desires they're not people she whispered her eyes staring down but traditions walking the street accumulations of desires and impulses taking the night air she watched it move in silence buried beneath names and buildings the crowd it was blind to itself its many eyes peered bewilderedly about its many legs moved in a thousand directions and yet it was identical faces different shaped bodies different colored suits these were part of a mask sentences that drifted in the night laughters sighs these were part of a mask under the clothes faces names talks of people was a real one the crowd it had no brain and yet this creature that moved in the street below in all streets everywhere made laws made wars and mumbled eternally the dark secrets of its soul the crowd a monstrous idiot that devoured men reason and beauty now it moved with a purr through the street it was going somewhere making love making plans diverting itself with little hopes its passions and its secrets slept it moved like a great somnambulist below her window, with a fatuous complacency in its dead eyes. Its many masks disported themselves in the night air. But let hunger or fear, let one of the inscrutable impulses awake it, and see what happened. Ah! Communes, terrors, rivers of blood, heads on spikes, torture and savagery. She must tell this all clearly to him, explain lucidly to him how the hero crowd of his singing was a gruesome and stupid criminal blind to itself and afraid of itself, and inventing laws to protect it from itself, how it was a formless thing with hungers and desires molded in the beginning of time, how it demanded proofs of itself that the darkness of its brain and the savagery of its heart were the twin gods from whom all wisdom and justice flowed. How the workers, the defeated ones, the underdogs he sang of and loved, were like the others, lesser masks envying superior masks. And how the idealisms, gods and hopes they all worshipped, were lies the beast whispered to itself, fairy tales by which the beast consoled itself yes a monster that devoured men who threatened its consolations a wild fanged beast purring eternally in the path of progress reason was a little cap the masks wore that every wind blew off her loneliness faded seated by her window doris no longer desired the lips of her lover there was another elation a knowledge of the thing in the street a certainty that she could make Leif Lindstrom understand. One evening, when he had returned to her after an absence of a month, 
she decided to talk calmly to him of the things she had been thinking. He came in with an air of caution that frightened her for an instant. She studied him as he took off his coat and hat and sat down. It was autumn outside. Dark wind seemed to have followed him in. This was an old trick of his that had once thrilled her. He seemed always to have come from far away places, to have risen out of depths with secrets in his eyes. Her heart yielded as she watched him. There was the quality about him she could never resist, the thing her senses clamored for. Not that he wrote poetry, but that he was a poet. It was almost useless to argue with him, to destroy him. No matter what he said or what he was doing, she could see him always as he really was a silent figure walking blindly over men and buildings, over days and nights, walking with its eyes snarling and its mouth tightened, walking over days and nights after a phantom, a silent figure walking after a phantom. The phantom whispered, Come! And the silent figure nodded its head and followed. That was how she saw him when her heart yielded, when she desired again to throw herself before him, make herself the phantom he was following. But the obsession in her changed the picture slowly. Not a phantom, but a face she knew, the face of the crowd. A wild-fanged monster that had cast a spell over her lover, and he went walking blindly after it, calling words to it, singing lullabies to it, when all these things should have been for her. Their talk began as she wished it. He was ill at ease. Why had he come? He was afraid to stay away? Why? She wondered questions as he sat uncertainly in the chair and offered vague gossip and information to explain his presence. Then she said abruptly, I'm writing a story. I've decided not to do any more poetry, but write a story. A book, maybe. He nodded. "'What about?' he asked. "'People. About people,' she smiled. She noticed his body stiffen and his eyes grow hard. "'Yes, about people,' he repeated slowly. He was cautious when he came to see her now. She had reason to make demands of him. She had given herself to him, and he didn't trust her and she was always trying to do something to him. He knew this. It was hard to understand her lately, but one thing was easy. She was not to be trusted. How they come together in crowds, she continued evenly, and lose themselves in a common identity. How they become a hideous, unreasoning savage, a single savage. I'm going to write a book making this savage the, the hero. She paused to look at him. He was inattentive, but she knew better. "'You should be interested,' she smiled. "'Why should I be interested?' he asked slowly. "'Because you write about people, too.' "'Yes.' "'Or think you do,' she went on. "'I'm going to write about people as a crowd, as one savage without a brain.' That's the crowd, and this savage is the hero of my story. Without a brain to think he creates out of his savagery the gods, laws, and illusions under which you and I live, Leif. Do you understand that? He looked at her without answer. Her heart grew alive with strength. She knew he was incapable of any answer but anger. His anger could usually defeat her but this time she felt she could laugh at him when he began to scowl. She stood up. You, she said softly, are like they are, like the crowd. You do not think or reason. You only feel. Words are accidents to you, crazy hats that rain down on your head. You write out of a hatred for things superior to the beast. You're mad at life because it isn't as beautiful as you'd like it to be. 
so when you get maddest you begin to sing lies about it. She laughed at the scowl on his face. Yes, I've figured it out, Leif. You're a terrible liar. When you say you love people, the crowd, you're a terrible liar, then. You don't love the crowd at all. What is your love of people but a blind infatuation with yourself? You hate them. Whose humanity are you all the time writing about and singing about? Your own. But you're ashamed to admit that. Sometimes people are ashamed to boast of themselves, so they boast of something else they've created in their own image, of their gods. That's the way you boast of your crowd. You're ashamed to boast of yourself, so you fix it up for yourself by giving the virtues you think you've got to people, and then singing about them as if you were an altruist and a sympathetic human observer. You're a great liar, Leif, and the thing you love is a lie you make up, because people are foul, and you know it. They're not like you or me. They can't think even as much as a rat thinks. They're as rattle-brained as chickens, as greedy as vultures. And they lie all the time. Good God, how they lie! You hate them, too. You know all this better than I do. But you keep feeling things, and you imagine they're things people feel. You— She stopped and looked at him with a smile. She had started to insult him, and had ended by pleading with him. His jaws were working as if he were chewing. This was his anger. But she felt no defeat, nothing but a slight confusion. She was disappointed in herself because she could not recapture the thoughts that had filled her during the month. They had been clear at their inception, but now they were mixed up with desires for leaf with a fear of him. They were mixed up so that, out of what she was saying, there arose no clear image of Leif and his relation to life or of the crowd and its foulness. "'Why don't you answer what I say?' she asked. "'Are you afraid to discuss things you are absorbed in? If people are so wonderful, let's talk about them.' She felt a triumph. She had destroyed something. She could tell by his eyes. They were becoming wild and unfixed. If she could be certain of destroying it forever, of killing in him the love for her rival, then— The little finger of one intelligent man is worth the whole of the French Revolution, she was saying excitedly. You're no different from the other cowards who devote themselves to flattering the monster. You know what I mean. The monster rewards liars and flatterers. All you have to do to be great in the eyes of the world is to celebrate the glories of the monster, to make a lickspittle of your genius. It's an old and easy formula. Why don't you think? You stand up with your eyes closed and sing about things that never existed, about the beauty of people and—and— and Lindstrom thrust his face close to her. She paused. A desire to laugh came as she stared at the two familiar features of the man. This was the face she had held in her hands and covered with kisses. Nights of passion and adoration had been shared with this face. Now it held itself savagely before her and grew blurred. Something had been destroyed in it. It was no longer familiar. It was somebody else's face. People, it said as if it were going to spit at her. Yes, like you say. Think about them. God damn. Leaf, she murmured. Don't call me Leaf, he glowered closer. Oh, then you're angry. Well, I didn't expect you to agree. She made her voice tender now. She did not want his face unfamiliar like this, as if she had never held it in her hands and covered it with kisses. But he continued to thrust himself unfamiliarly before her. "'Yes, I agree about the crowd,' he
he answered, his eyes swinging over her head, his jaws still working. I agree. You got em right. Down in the mud of themselves. And me with them. Do you hear that? Me singing with them. Get me now. I'm going to tell you. She moved away from this unfamiliar face, but it came closer again. I don't want any of your brains. Not for mine. I want to be like I am. This beast you talk about, that's me. He can't talk or reason. All right. He won't then. But he'll do something else. He'll live. He'll go on living. Yes. He raised his voice to a shout. I agree with you. Because I'm the crowd. Do you get that, you dirty, you dirty fool, you— The oath brought his passion into his head. His hand clenched and his fist shot into her face. She staggered away from him, calling his name. He watched her fall against a couch. A rage cried in him. He was a liar, was he? And a coward? All right, he was. Look out for all liars and cowards, then. He walked toward the couch and stood above her. What did she want of him? She wanted something. Tears filled him. People, people that sweated and grunted and crawled around like beasts and raised their eyes at night to the stars. This monster she gabbed about, this thing without hands or eyes, that was it. She was crying on the couch. All right, let her. But she was crying because she wanted something. His hands grabbed her head and straightened her face until their eyes were looking into each other. Listen, he said. He was shaking her. I'm going away. Eyes watched each other. She looked until the face she had once kissed became entirely strange. There was no leaf, no lover, but a face staring murderously into hers. But there was something else. Tears behind the stare. Why was he weeping? The question, like a tiny visitor, sat down in her mind. He let her go and walked from the room, grabbing his hat and coat into his hands as he went. Doris listened. Down the stairs. Outside. He was gone. She went to the window. Her eye had swelled and her cheek pained. She sat down and looked into the street. He hit me she was whispering to herself. She began to weep with shame. But her tears seemed to soften her heart toward him. He had cried, too. She arose and went to the bed. Here she had lain with him, warm, familiar hours. Here her arms had held him. She threw herself down and wept aloud. End of chapter 12 Recording by Roger Moline